Good afternoon. I'd like to call our meeting to order, please. Today uh, being June 2nd, welcome to the Charlottesville City School Board meeting. I would at this point um, ask for a motion to allow Mr. Bryant to attend virtually. I so move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. Opposed? Any opposed? Thank you. I do want to ask uh, everybody please to join us in a moment of silence. Um, we do this every meeting. I use this personally to kind of just get myself grounded. Um, this is not necessarily reflective of enough or, or what we really need to um, address some of the atrocities that we all have been witness to. So I just felt like I needed to say that, but if you'll please join us now, thank you. Thank you. And if you'll please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, and Madam Clerk, will you please uh, call roll for board members? Yes, Madam Chair, Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Present. Ms. Dooley. Here. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. McKeever. Here. Mr. Morris. Here. And Ms. Torres. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And now um, a motion for approval of our proposed agenda, please. So a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I do wanna make, What's my little place? I'm sorry. I do want to um, make two announcements. Um, during the consent agenda, you all did uh, approve two personnel actions. And so I wanted to recognize those two individuals. One, I do not. I think we've done the oh, no. consent agenda. No, I'm sorry. We have okay, just <laughs> I'm happy to move the consent agenda. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's roll that up since we've been, sorry. Yes, may I have a motion real quickly, please, uh, to approve the consent agenda? And second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I don't Any know if opposed? you need to note that I'm abstaining from this vote. Thank you. Yes, sorry, I jumped the gun there on that. Now, Dr. Gurley. I'm sorry. You know. There are two items on the consent agenda that I, uh, that I want to um, make the public aware of. So I do want to, there were two action items. Um, the first is for, uh, the first is for the uh, director of um, human resources. I do want to recognize Ms. Maria Lewis. It uh, brings me great pleasure to introduce her as the director of um, human resources. <laughs> Mrs. Lewis, Ms. Lewis has been with us with uh, Charlottesville City Schools for 24 years. Um, throughout her um, CCS career, she has served as classroom teacher, um, coordinator of technology integration. And for the last four years, she has served as um, human resources um, coordinator. Um, I would like to add that Mrs. Lewis is, Ms. Lewis is thoughtful, attentive, compassionate, and brings a level of emotional intelligence to the position that will ensure that we will continue to provide 
first class services to our employees. And most recently, uh, Ms. Lewis was an integral component of helping to deploy the electronic contract. So Ms. Lewis, thank you uh, for accepting the position. I have another one. Um, it's our, um, I'm also pleased to announce that um, Mrs. Carmela Johnson will be the new principal of um, Clark School. And I know with that weather, she may not have made it. Uh, I know she was going to come, um, but she's going to be our new principal of Clark School. Um, since 2017, she's uh, been the assistant principal over at Johnson. She served as assistant principal and instructional coach. Um, she previously served as teacher um, and she served as teacher over at Greenbrier and she, she was over there since tw um, 2007. She is a proven instructional leader and she's a collaborative. Uh, her approach is a relational with staff, staff and students and we know that she's going to do a great job. And I just wanna highlight that I've gotten so many emails from the Johnson family about her leaving. And one of the, one of the um, teachers sent me, she said, I just wanted to let you know that um, she will be thoroughly missed by the Johnson staff and, and she is a, and that Clark is getting a gym. So I do wanna congratulate Clark and um, Carmela Johnson. And those are mine. Thank you. Thank you. And again, apologies for jumping, jumping through the agenda there. So now we are at our first opportunity for comments from members of the community. A reminder to anybody who would like to speak to please um, step up, state your name and address, and you are limited to three minutes for your comments. And I believe here in the auditorium on our sheet, we have Miss Jessica Taylor. Hello, Madam Chair, Dr. Gurley, school board. At the May school board meeting, Dr. Gurley was directed to draft a resolution for collective bargaining and to include representatives from the school board and the Charlottesville Education Association in that process. In order to provide the transparency assured to all stakeholders by both the school board and Dr. Gurley, here is my report from the first meeting that took place on Monday, May 16th, 2022. At the onset, we agreed on norms for our work together and addressed any potential barriers to our discussion success. The educators present shared our goals and assumptions for a resolution, one that complies with all Virginia laws, limits costs to both the CEA and the school division, and includes user-friendly language wherever applicable. Dr. Gurley agreed to use the resolution the CEA submitted at the April 14th board meeting as the starting point for a collaborative development process. The board members present presented committed to learning more about the technical details of bargaining and to meeting with their fellow board members prior to our next meeting in early June. As they shared concerns about the responsibility they feel in moving forward with bargaining, they reiterated their dedication to an open and collaborative dialogue with us about what bargaining could look like in CCS. Both groups also acknowledge the fact that the current funding process for public schools leaves the final overarching budget allocation in the hands of city council, and that collective bargaining will not necessarily free up additional funds for priorities, including compensation, regardless of how much both the board and the educators may want funding for a shared goal. We are on the cusp of an exciting opportunity for all of us involved in the Charlottesville City Schools. And with that comes the joint responsibility to be thoughtful and intentional. We need to employ patience as we work to answer everyone's questions and craft a carefully considered resolution that can serve us all for many years to come. At this time, I remain optimistic that the process will remain collaborative and will result in a resolution that meets the needs of both educators, the board, and central office. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, currently like to make public comment? 
And I'll have Mr. Como check and see if there's anybody. I don't believe anybody was signed up. Um, at this time, I do not see anybody who has their hand raised, but I will ask them if they would like to make public comments and they are online for a Zoom meeting, they should uh, raise their hand or indicate so in the chat so we can promote them for speaking uh, for their three minutes. Okay, thank you. We'll close public comment for now. There is another opportunity towards the end of the meeting. So thank you. And we will move on to um, educational highlights. All right, Dr. Odie. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening. Uh, by uplifting student voices, students attending Lugo McGinnis Academy were able to leverage engagement, mastery, change, efficacy, and entrepreneurship. The acronym is E-M-C-E-E-M-C -E -E to harness momentum towards the competencies included in Virginia's five C's, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. Students gained critical consciousness and creative thinking by rewriting their own school and community narratives and have begun to impact the beliefs and learning of school staff, and community members. Tonight, a sample of what this looked like in practice will be shared with you by students and staff from LMA. At this time, I'll ask Dr. Jill Dahl to come up to introduce her students and team members who will be sharing the presentation with you this evening. Dr. Dahl. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Gurley. Um, so this has been an exciting year for us and we've been so blessed by the opportunity this grant has afforded us. Um, but I'm gonna let the experts who have been boots on the ground doing the work, Mr. Dragangi and Edison Duelo up to the podium and they're gonna talk to you more about our program. Olivia, has, Olivia, did you wanna? Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Gurley, members of the board. My name is Carly Dragangi. I get to teach English at LMA. And we wanted to share with you the work that we've done thanks to VDOE K-12 innovation grants we received this year. It was our planning year and our school innovation is, as you heard, it's called MC. We named it after the hip hop role MC to symbolize the fact that we wanted to give students the mic to amplify their voices. MC stands for Engagement, Mastery, Change, Efficacy, Entrepreneurship. The goals of MC are to empower students in community relationships, to develop student consciousness, entrepreneurship, and self-efficacy, to build holistic curriculum learning and progress, and to influence teacher practice, cultural responsiveness, and a sense of student belonging. In the spirit of MC, I would like to hand the mic to a student leader of one of the research groups, Paco Duello. Hi, my name is Edison Duello, but my team calls me Paco. I'm glad to be standing here and telling you about our neighborhood project we did as a teamwork effort. It started at the beginning of the school year when we noticed how school lunches does not bring us to bond like food should. We had the idea if we made our own food at school, we would have more positive vibes at school. We can inspire communities to get together and do the same. We researched foods from different countries, how in like places in Switzerland, some kids cook for other students each week. We wanted to try something similar to that. We visited Culinary Concepts, a culinary training site here in Charlottesville to research how they plan cooking events and how we can use them to our own abilities. We took all the old and unused materials to make space for the new materials. We rearranged the rooms so we had space to work in an easier environment. 
So far, our neighborhood project kitchen has held five cooking events, such as breakfast burritos, breakfast casseroles, tacos and smoothies, chicken alfredo, and chipotle bowls. We surveyed students about their attitudes towards school lunch and how the food we cooked made them feel. Here are some of the results from our surveys. In the future, we want Neighborhood Kitchen to continue to keep spreading love through food making and combining everyone's backgrounds and different nation, na national, nationality uh, with different food recipes. Thank you for listening to what I have to say. Additional student projects included our trip to DC where students had the research question, who gets to decide what pop culture should be put into museums and libraries? How does pop culture represent individual and collective identity? We visited the Library of Congress, the National Museum of Hip Hop, and a black owned bookstore specializing in books of people of African descent. Dr. Dahl will speak to the third section. So in, an, another component of our grant was to expose our students to college and university and secondary programs. And so we, along with our partners, the Uhuru Foundation, were able to take our students to two HBCU campus universities um, this spring. Uh, the first campus we visited was Norfolk State University. Um, where we had a traditional tour with college guides. Um, great experience, kids got to ask questions um, and just really get to experience college um, atmosphere on a college campus. Um, the second visit that we did was Virginia State University. Um, it, it was a particular special event. They, it happened to be one of their mental wellness days. And so they had quite the fanfare happening um, and Dr. Wes Bellamy um, also kind of gave us a specialized behind the scenes tour. And the kids were able to participate in a large um, community discussion that had community experts and leaders from uh, Richmond City, um, as well as the college students from, um, I believe Dr. Bellamy's class and um, really talked about um, reform and how to work to prevent young Africans, uh, particularly males from ending up in the juvenile detention system, talked about resources and supports and things that are available in the community for students. And it was just a great platform for student voice. And it was a great experience for our students to watch, but they also got to, to listen and participate um, and give their input as well. Um, one other um, that's not on the slide that we just wanted to highlight, we also have a student through the grant we were able to um, cover her tuition, she was awarded an opportunity to attend the Young Writers um, Workshop through UVA that'll be held at Bridgewater this summer. And it aligns with what her research was on. And so through that, with the grant, we're able to pay for her two week um, tuition to attend that campus. Um, and the kids have just really embraced this whole cooking component. Um, and it's uh, chaotic and beautiful and um, if you follow our Lugo McGinnis Facebook page, you'll see some of the crazy antics. They wear science goggles when the onions get too spicy. Um, they're quite inventive in that regard. Um, but it's really done a great job to bring our community together and we look forward to just continuing to grow it. Um, we have applied for the grant for a second year and we'll find out in August if we are able to receive it. Um, <clears throat> and the, the highlight of that was the work that the students did, the research that they did, and the time and energy they put into it, they were paid. We were able to pay them um, for their time and the, and the ideas that they brought to the table through our collaboration with UVA and the YCAR uh, lab. So it's been a really great experience for our kids, and we were excited we were able to share with you guys. Thank you. Does um, anybody have any questions? Sorry, we, we might not let you down yet. I don't know if anybody, any board members had any comments or questions. I, I'm curious if you're gonna continue with the cooking program, if, if you're gonna open it up and if we can put in orders and, and support you because it all sounded good. <laughs> I, we do 
plan to continue with it, we were actually able to um, uh, replace and upgrade our stove and refrigerator. To we have a larger capacity now to hold um, supplies and goods, but it is something we've built into our master schedule next year, where we will have. Um, actually, it was Mr. Koenig's idea to have a student staff half hour um, sort of cooking class kind of laboratory type um, element to it. So it is something that staff and students have all really bought into and kind of has enjoyed it. So we do plan to continue it and open it up. <laughs> I don't know about taking it. We just might be right here. Um, I would say um, it started really as like, me and Ms. D every day in school, we was talking about school lunches and you know how the vibes are different. And I thought to myself, like I would, when I was in probably eighth grade at Buford Middle School, we had like a cooking class where we'll make like goodies, like desserts and stuff. So I wanted to bring that back for a bunch of high schoolers because I know they love food, just like I love food. And then um, I started um, with the breakfast burritos first. I think burritos is like, you can't go wrong with a burrito. You just can't, you know? So. <laughs> We um we sat we went shopping and that was a good experience you know for life you know without school yeah I think without shopping I don't know what I would do with life so uh, that she really helped me out learning what I need and what to do and now my whole team in the past two weeks I haven't even been cooking it's been um everybody else doing it as a teamwork effort and that's when our wedding is spread at it's like a community I feel that's why I called it neighborhood kitchen because we're all in neighborhood everybody's a part of everybody so I feel as if if we all stand together and make food no one's gonna go wrong with what you eat. You, you don't want to eat bad food, so your friend ain't going to make you bad food. So I just think it helps everybody out. And now we're all vibing and we're bonding as the school should. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. All right. We're moving because we jumped. I jumped. So now we're on to action items. Yes, Dr. Odie will bring us the um, Title I consolidated application. All right. Um, that was outstanding. I just have to come behind them. <laughs> um, good evening again, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Gurley. At the May school board meeting, uh, staff shared the federal program's consolidated application with you for your review. At this time, we do recommend that the board take action on this application. I'll move the approval of the application. I'll second. I'll second. Any questions from other board members? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Thank sure. you. All right, and we have, um, Ms. Hoover and um, Ms. Powell. So Ms. Powell. Thank you, Dr. Gurley, Madam Chair, members of the board. Whenever we talk about finance, I'm never up here alone, whether Ms. Hoover's standing with me or she's over there, let me be clear. <laughs> um, she does a lot of the hard work and the heavy lifting. I just get the um, pleasure of presenting the, the, the results of those efforts. I'm gonna hang tight here for just a moment because the presentation's not up. And I think um, probably be a good thing if it is. Because we have some very interesting things to talk about. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about year-end, re some recommendations for uh, year-end fund designations and a brief update about the FY23 budget for next year. And just to be clear, um, the reason this is coming to you as action is because it's your last regular meeting of the of the year. And as we clo closing a fiscal year is a special adventure. It's never the same twice. One of my predecessors, Ed Gillespie, used to compare it to landing a jumbo jet on Route 29. And I used to talk about it as a bullet train because that was a term from GE where you're, if your track is the revenue and the operations of this school division, it's like a high speed moving train. And you've got to bring that train to a stop before you run out of track. You don't want to bring that train to a stop too soon because you didn't then you didn't accomplish everything you could have or should have, right? But if you but you definitely do not want to and frankly cannot by law overshoot the track, right? So um, it is it's not for the faint of heart. Um, Ms. Hoover does a tremendous job um, using the tools and helping us kind of know where we are. And so um, we are 
we have a couple of key recommendations we'd like to share with you this evening, and we need to know, we need your decisions so that we know how to close this year out. Um, so you can go to the next slide, thank you. So you may recall we came to you in the fall and said our vacancy savings are running much higher than normal. Um, and so we made a recommendation to do a, to, for you all to just go ahead and tell us that it was just okay to do a one-time transfer of up to $500,000 to be designated to help maintain the grant funded positions that were put in place in FY20 for, um, for social workers, for social emotional supports. Um, our vacancy rate at that time when we came to you in the fall, of course we had hope that that vacancy, those accu that accumulation of vacancy savings would slow down or even stop beyond what we were pretty confident it was already in the bag. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. I can tell you that our, even now, and of course sometimes late in the year your vacancies go back up, but the vacancies have held at 30 to 40 or more at any given time when we're looking at it. That, it, that is compared to a norm of single digit vacancies. So I, I just wanna be clear of why we're in this situation. Um, it also helps that Dr. Baptist has held at least three positions for the past year. So that's also a savings. Um, so our current projections indicate that our year end funds may total up to about 1.7 million. That's where we think we are. And we don't have a crystal ball. I wanna be clear, as good as, we're, as good as Ms. Hoover is and as good as the tools are that we put in place, we can't know exactly where we are. There's hourly payroll and things that's gonna to continue to come in. Um, but we have two, you know, two recommendations for you given where we think we are with closing this year. The first is around safety and security. Um, and you may recall when Mr. Lee was with us at a previous board meeting, um, um, Madam Chair asked, you know, what can we do? And one of the things I was pretty quick to say is we need funding to, to remain steady in our safety and security work for the equipment and that piece. And that's not the entirety of the safety security model. You can go to the next slide, by the way, I just realize we're not, um, the slide should say year-end designation safety and security. Whoop. So I think we went, that's okay. Give it a minute. Here we go. There we go. That's the one we're on. Okay. So the grant each year, we, we were, we've been relying heavily on the um, state security grant to continue to do our safety work. And the grant application is made each July um, and this is just for equipment. It doesn't fund any positions or anything else. It's just for equipment and only certain types of equipment and projects can be done with this money. But the awards have become later each year, slipping from what used to be always September, October, you knew how much money you had to work with and you would proceed with projects from there. It was still a little tight because you have to finish your projects by June 30th. In reality, the way this program is set up to work is whenever, even though you apply in July, you actually can reach back and grab projects from that from May. So work we're doing now with, is, is eligible in our next grant application. Or that's a, the, in any given year, that's the case. So there's almost this expectation that you're reaching back and claiming work you've already done on your application. Because May is when they sell the, the bonds each year that fund this program, the state program. As I mentioned before, project execution before June was tricky, even when they were telling you what your award was in September and October timeframe. But this year, we didn't even have our award announcement until June 10th, not June, January, January 10th. Sorry, give that start to Jay. January 10th is when we found out how much money we had to work with. Fortunately, we'd already started our projects in the last summer. And we did that in cooperation with Michael Goddard because who let us use some small cap funds that were available because of projects that they weren't able to get done either. So we, were, we just started working, even without knowing for sure about the status of the grant. And you may recall, those of you who've been on the board for a while, that we, the way we've approached this in the past is you know, take it from fund balance, come back to the board for authorization for use of fund balance for the grant match, because the grant match hasn't even been budgeted in the past up until this point. Basically also another consideration is as we have been pressing to expand our, and enhance our security systems, you also have to maintain these systems. And that's not really been a clear budget line either for us. We've not brought that to you as an appropriation 
in any of our operation budget discussions. So we have an opportunity now to be creative and do something that addresses these needs, but and without putting additional pressure on future operating budget discussions, which are already gonna be challenging enough. Our recommendation is that the board move to allow a recurring annual designation from available year-end funds to the security equipment project in the special revenue funds, it's under our grants programs, an amount sufficient to maintain a balance up to $350,000. This is the current maximum annual grant award along with the required local match, which is $312,500, plus it allows us another, another $37,500 to address maintenance and those certain types of projects that the security grant will not touch, which are things like the master rekey. They will not touch a rekey. That's just not a grant eligible project. This, and you should know, I don't even, you may remember, we got the maximum award right now. That's what we're working through. In the four years I've had, I've done the program, I've gotten the maximum twice. And the other two, and I think it's kind of a turn-taking thing. I don't, I don't know any, the rhyme or reason as to how we're awarded, but we get awards every year. The amounts vary. Um, the lowest I think I've gotten was around 20, 30, some thousand. Then I've gotten 78,000. Then we got the max twice. So, um, if we take, if you accept this recommendation, if you approve it, this enables us to continuously execute on our security infrastructure projects without waiting or any hesitation or concern or awkwardness of having to ask for approvals to just keep things going. Um, and knowing that we're never gonna let this fund grow unnecessarily high, but we have an opportunity to establish it now in a way that we have a clear runway to just keep moving. Um, it helps us address the significant execution issues that are called by what's become the later and later awarding of the grant. Um, it also helps us keep it out of the, just like I talked about not entangling this need in the operation budget discussions, it also takes it out of small cap, which is what we had to lean into this year and kind of take a little bit of a gamble to get work done because we already knew supply chain was a mess and we had to get moving. By the way, there was, I didn't mean to skip the sub bullet, but we did have to, and we were given a 90 day extension because I called the state way back and then I confirmed with them in April. We're not getting, we haven't gotten everything quite completed from this past grant award because of supply chain issues, but we're on it and we expect everything to be finished um, this summer. I know we're talking about a little of that um, later this evening in, in future discussions. And last but not least, we really have to set aside money to maintain these systems as we continue to grow and enhance them. So. That's the first recommendation for designation of year-end funds. The second one. Can, can I interrupt because I feel like. That was a lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I feel like the next one will be a lot too. So, um, sure. But just with respect to them, have you talked to Mike about this and how is city count, like would they, you know, we're supposed to split it with a, a year-end balance with the, with the city. So would this count towards the, our, where would this count? So Mike Goddard's well aware of this because I've had to work in partnership with him to um, handle what we, what we face this year with the security projects. Um, it does affect what would be the year end gain share for this year, but Mike is not concerned about this for the CIP. If you've heard uh, Mayor Snook speak, they already have a lot of money in the CIP sitting that's queued up for things that need to be done that they've struggled also to get completed because of COVID and supply chain and so forth. So um, Mike Goddard, I can say is very aware of this, um, but it will, it does affect what gain share. There would likely still be gain share in the end, even after, whenever I speak to you, I'm usually pretty conservative with our numbers, but um, this is an opportunity, I, I just, it is what it, I just shared. It's it's going to become an operational budget ask if we make this move now in concert with the grant. I think it just takes a lot of pressure off of this area of need, but it's certainly the will and decision of the board. I mean, it, it's, it sounds like it makes sense. I'm not criticizing that. I just wonder to the extent that we have gained share with the city, can we split it? Is this, you know, like, can we count this towards the city's part of the gain share so that we can have additional funds you know, instead of like a 50-50, we do 70-30 or something so like that. So one other reason that we want to hold these funds in special revenues instead of in the CIP, and I spoke with Mike about this as well, 
when it comes to these security systems and so forth, we're really managing them. The city kind of pro provides some consult and a little bit of project oversight on the master rekey piece. Certainly the visitor vestibule construction, like the little literal, the glass and the framing and all that, that's handled through Mike's team, but the access control and the cameras and the majority of it's handled with us. And so I think there's this feeling that it makes more sense for the funding to be held with us because we're managing this work. And I think the city's quite glad that they are not, they don't have responsible for our cameras. They, they're not responsible for our camera systems and our access control. Um, when we started this process a long time, it seems like a long time ago, I haven't been, however many years ago with access control, um, there was different, there were different people in leadership at the city, but they were, they really didn't want to have that responsibility. Um, but anyway, I don't know if that's getting at all the components of your question. Okay, but this um, it, this has been vetted with with Mike Goddard certainly, um, and he understands where we are and where we're trying to go. Uh, okay, so if it's so, do, are there any other questions about the recommendation to make this move with security? And again, so this funding or this surplus is from those thirty to forty vacancies it's from city that we're just going to continue to hold and that money will run it's accumulated from this way this year having so many vacancies and it's so in that spirit it's one time but again with the interplay of the grant this just really puts us in a nice place to have a lever we can pull in a way to manage this area of operational need in concert with the grant moving forward um and we have an opportunity to establish the fund in a healthy way now. Um, it does not affect, and this is in the conclusion slide, it, this has nothing to do with CARES and ARPA money that we are hoping to have to bring to bear on reconfiguration. It is local local and state money, if you will, basic aid and, and that mixture of money. The, the, the funds that come to us for no specific reason, but it is not out of CARES and ARPA money, if that's kind of what that question is maybe. I'm wondering, um, you know, we, we now are in this situation where we have quite an accumulation of funds to do this, and there's no problem with, I think, in, in my mind, with doing this. It's a good use of the funds. Um, is, can you envision any kind of situation where we, you know, the end of year funds are, are much lower, um, where there's some kind of emergency? Does this lock us in to? Yeah, so they're worded up to. Up to everything you see presented tonight is intentionally oh, worded as to, we're yeah. asking for approval up to because we're okay. like we're not a, we like gain share we certainly want to do our yeah. part with that we've got this crazy as I talked described from the vacancy we're just in an unprecedented situation the two things you'll understand about this is it's everything's worded as up to to give us because we need we'll need to make decisions over the next 30 or so days to close out the fiscal year and you don't meet in July, so we just need a, not, a, a yay or a nay sort of direction from the board now. Um, but what was the other thing I was going to share? Oh, these are non these are non recurring expenses in the sense, and that's always such a priority, right? To like this shouldn't reoccur where we have this this level of vacancies. And so these are things that are once funded. It's not going to require, or you know, it's it's not something we're committed to do in an ongoing fashion. And so there are flexibilities built into these recommendations. Thank you, good questions. Are we ready to move on to the next, the next uh, topic? <laughs> okay, this is a big one, near and dear to my heart. Yep, buses, okay. So as of February, so not that long ago, and it wasn't well publicized, um, there's been a change in the regulations governing people transportation in Virginia. Individuals with the S endorsement on a regular license, not a CDL, but the S endorsement on a regular license can transport students in a type A bus daily, not just activity stuff, but like the, be their daily bus route. We have tried over the past year and had so many creative discussions because, and we kept being told, no, you really can't do that because if it was the transportation of the student every day to and from for their core education, you just, it rose to that level of the CDL requirement. We couldn't figure out a way around it, even for the small bus. But we now have an option to transport up to 14 students via type A bus without a CDL. And as of May 27th, 36 CCS employees from across all of our schools 
have expressed interest in driving the Type A bus. So um, you can go to the next slide. So this opens up a possibility for us to have something that's pretty common in counties. And I've been exploring this with the city previously, but it's very complicated because what we found out is that even though a custodian works for us and then they would work for the city, they are um, considered, we're considered one employer for purposes of Fair Labor Standards Act. And then you have two different timekeeping systems. And it was a lot of complication that when we talked, you know, we weren't sure how to pull this off. But when it's all within CCS, it's very, then we can behave like other school systems. It becomes much easier. And I, by no means is this every combination, but what you see typically in counties are IAs who also drive a bus, custodians who also drive a bus, and nutrition workers who also drive a bus. That is not to say that in Charlottesville, an instructional coach or a teachers or whoever, but we, I will say that with teachers and folks who have after school meetings, it can be tricky to allow for this. We actually have had a teacher who had a CDL drive a school bus for a period of time to help us out during the crisis. And it is hard because then that teacher is just as far as after school PL and things like that, they have to drive their bus route. So that's the reason for the combinations that are listed up there. But anyway, um, if we go with the gasoline buses, the current lead time is about nine months. So as exciting as this solution is to bring to bear on our larger problem, uh, we won't have these until next spring. But if the board would like for us to move forward, um, we would like to establish in the special revenue fund, again, in the designated programs and grants section, a project for the purchase of type A buses. And we're asked, the recommendation is to designate up to $800,000 of the projected FY22 year end funds for the purchase of up to 10 type A buses and implementation of a dual employment pilot program to help fill the persistent gap between supply and demand for people transportation services. The one bright spot of potentially having to wait this long for buses is it gives us plenty of time to develop the driver compensation plan, the fleet management plan for fuel and maintenance. We would do that cooperatively with the city. Of course, we would still use the garage to maintain if they're gasoline buses. And then determine how we would, what would be the criteria for driver selection. I wanna be clear, it should be need and efficiency based because part of the benefit of doing this is you take the bus home and, you, and on your way in to work, you pick up students and so forth. And so need and efficiency would factor into the selection of drivers. And I hope we have even more than the 36 express interest as we're able to more fully bake this program and present it to our, um, our, all of our employees. Um, there, of course, there are of course additional uses for type A buses being the extra and co-curricular trips and also transportation for alternative programs. Right now, the city could use more of these type of buses, but they're, they don't have a plan to purchase them. Um, Dr. Gurley, myself, and several other members of what I call our trip team, it's a team of leaders that meet regularly with transportation to try to work out routing and things like that. We met at CAT and they're aware that we're looking at these type A bus purchases. They, they know about this program. Um, Mr. Saunders was there and Garland Williams. So they, they know this is again, not something that hasn't been discussed with our partners in transportation. And I think they, they too are excited about the possibility. So this is another item that we're bringing before you for consideration with what we project to be our year in funds. And again, it's worded as designate up to. I was just wondering if there are any electric options. Yes, and uh, we are actively exploring that. Um, the infrastructure takes more time to put in place but the availability of the buses actually may be sooner. And that is something that as we proceed, that would be brought back to you for um, decision. Um, we would have to figure out how that happens, perhaps in a special meeting or whatever, because that is a big decision that we still need to make. I have co pretty concrete information about what the gasoline option looks like. It's not diesel, these are gas. So that's what this is here for, but we can talk, we will be talking with the others we get about the other options we get more info. Thank you. Any other questions about buses before we move on or she moves on? Thank you. Okay. Last and but not least, um, so the state budget has been done, but we don't have our calc tools yet. We've been hoping to have that so we'd know exactly what it means for us. But um, Ms. Hoover did a good job of putting together some summaries here of, you know, 
basically going into the uh, final budget deliberations, the House uh, version of the budget would have given us $126,000 less than what was in our um, you know, adopted budget because that was based on the governor's proposal. And the Senate was only $48,000 less than what was in our adopted budget. But regardless, as long as what we get in our hands when we finally see the calc tool doesn't deviate wildly from either of these, we won't really require a technical adjustment because within these realms, it can be balanced with, um, with the ESSER funding. So it's not something that's gonna require you to visit, revisit the budget that has been adopted, the operating budget for FY 2023. And we don't anticipate there's gonna be anything significant. We just do not know as of tonight exactly where we landed yet. And so in summary, and I, I appreciate these are some big ideas, especially the bus piece, that's a pilot program. But um, I think that we're gonna have to make some bold moves to address the challenges we currently face. And that, that in and of itself is not gonna solve the whole problem, but it's a step. And it's one we've been kicking around for a while. We just couldn't figure out a way to make it work until we got that relief on the S endorsement being applicable to a regular driver's license. That, that was a little, hopefully a game changer for us. So um, I've already talked a lot and everything is summarized here. The recommended action is in bold at the bottom if the board chooses to um, advance both options. I just have a few quick questions. I may have missed it. I apologize. How many students um, can travel on the smaller buses? 14. 14. And so if we ended up putting 10 into service and they were running our regular routes, it could get another 140 students on. And then, excuse my ignorance, is there any plus to it being a bus as opposed to like a, a van that sounds weird but like a, a different type of vehicle to transport kids in yes so the there are lots of regulations which i'm not an expert on but when you transport students daily for their regular transportation to and from school you really need to be in a yellow and it even gets to the color it has to be yellow it needs to have all the lights and you do have to have that s endorsement training so the vans are okay for activities and things like that but the standards for people transportation for safety are, are really quite high i've, I've learned and so the vans, um, vans are an option, but they don't hold as many students. They're generally frowned upon beyond acti uh, periodic activity use. And I also found out they're not any more available than the type A gas buses. It's similar wait time, even to get, the van and even to get vans right now. And I apologize if I missed it. How much is the cost per? Bus? bus? Actually, didn't you? the buses are like 70,000 each. That's with the camera system and everything in place, air conditioning. Um, so the 100,000 that's above that 700,000 for actually the purchase of the buses is the, to allow for funding the pilot, paying people and, and getting everything else in place for the roughly three months that if we go the gasoline route, it looks like that's what we would have. And also just as a point of reference, if we were, if we were, which, it's not looking super favorable right now, but if we maintain the number of drivers we had going through the end of this school year, our wait list was right around 200 that was remaining. No high priorities on that list either. So in my happiest moments, I was thinking, ah, I've got, you know, if we, if we can sustain, that's a humongous if and not looking really probable right this moment, because there's still retire, dri driver retirements and attrition that's still happening, I'm sad to report, um, after the end of the school year. But if we could maintain the number we have in service right now, bring these to bear, we'd be so close, so close to closing the gap. So the, the number for the pilot was kind of a number that came to me by thinking about what we needed to close the gap as we've been operating and in the best of times as we close out this year. Plus there was some thought of if I have sort of one designated per school and then I have to have one in reserve because if a driver's sick or anything and that bus is one that they're driving to and from home, I have to have a backup bus and at least one substitute, which Julie and I joke will be one of us, um, to go to, to press into service because that is those, you know, we have to be responsible for that. So there's a lot of things to consider. We don't undertake this lightly. It's gonna be a big project for, for my team, me and my team. And Julie's over there smiling. <laughs> do, um, do you happen to know the cost of per bus of an electric bus? 
So that's a little different. Um, I don't have that for you now, uh, but that information will be forthcoming. It's different because the, pro the program that I'm looking at is a lease program. And it includes, it's, it's, it's kind of like um, apples and pears, other than the fact they both have four wheels as far as how it works, because the maintenance is included, the, the, the fuel, the electric can be included. It's very intriguing. Um, and I just started over the, as this idea started to hatch, I just started reaching out and, and getting that information. I'm working on getting that, all those details, and there's a lot to consider there. And some really, really um, exciting things to think about there. Well, saving money on gas. Lots of Great. exciting aspects, yeah. So, Ms. McKeever? Um, I just, I wonder, um, so thank you. I feel like this is a really innovative and good idea. I also feel like it um, needs a little bit more vetting. Um, and I feel like $800,000 for transportation um, is a great start, but I feel like we, I would rather pay people <laughs> to drive buses than buy more buses. And that is a, you know, like we've gone to city council, we've asked them to give raises to our bus drivers, we've asked them to, uh, you know, they've generally cooperated with us, but we, we, you know, for $800,000, we could get those 36 people CDL license and try to get them um, on the buses that we already have. So I'm very concerned, not because I, I mean, I want beautiful, brilliant ideas. I want us to be able to brainstorm them, but I do feel like we have to be a check in this system to um, say, what are we really doing? We're cut, you know, we're gonna have 10 buses then in four years, maybe that we have no use for because we have a better economy. Um, or people are getting paid their, you know, for this work um, in a fair way. And I I just I'm kind of frustrated that um, we can't do that that there's that that this is where we are. Um, and also, I just want to say, as having two people who are on that wait list, not high priority, it is a high priority for every family to be transported back to school. Like, we do it every day. I have to take work off. I have to do it. You know, I just want you to be, you know, even the children who are not being transported right now need to be transported. And I need, I feel like this is a great idea, but I'd love to see a little bit more transparency in what has been discussed and um, but not because I do believe that you guys have really thrown everything at it there, but I just feel like this is um, one idea of many, many ideas. And I just wonder if this is the best idea to quickly get us um, 140 more kids being transported to school. I just don't know. Good. Um, great questions. The one thing I will share I don't have all the answers, but one answer I do have is that of the, if you consider, if we purchased up to 10 of these buses or actually eight or nine or whatever, and again, it depends on what model we go with. Um, we have at least five alternative school routes right now that could benefit from switching to this type of bus. Some of them are being run with full-size buses. So that was another thing that was sort of, when we try to think of how to scope and size a pilot, there would be that um, piece of it. Uh, then the others could be used for like activities or different things. So, but I definitely, um, I understand. And I don't know, the other, other thing I would share is the CDL, the, sh the CDL shortage and the, the shortage of school bus drivers and this, the unique situation we have with the model with the city handling our buses. Um, it's a tough puzzle to solve. Um, and I would welcome any comments from anyone else who would like to chime in there, but um, I, as a control freak of sorts, um, this was one thing I felt like after it seems like an eternity of wrestling with this problem, something like, okay, we could do this and, and start to have more um, resources to bring to bear on the problem. I guess that's the yeah. sum of it. And I, and I think that 
Miss McKeever's points are very well taken from us, um, you know, and, and I think we can have more conversations at our, our board advance with regard to um, school transportation, you know, in our most recent um, meeting, you know, we may be down half, um, you know, of our drivers potentially is a conversation that we could be having. So, you know, while we are going to remain good partners with the city, we probably are also going to have to solve some of our own problems, unfortunately. Um, and so this is one of those, one of many mechanisms that we will be using to do that, but most definitely uh, more information will be forthcoming. And to that point, and I just had an idea, I did want to, as I said before, before an actual procurement is made, there would have to be some communication with the board about what's you know, determined to be the optimal model, if even just from a technology standpoint, given all, all circumstances once they're known. Another way that um, this could be thought of is up to $800,000 to set aside to use where most needed to address our transportation issues. Yeah, I think that's, and so, yeah, I stand for you tonight. I don't have all the answers. We've got some ideas. <laughs> And we have some thoughts and we're trying to put together a plan of action. I think it's really more about holding the money to do something. And I think to Dr. Gurley's point, we may need to be prepared to do the best we can with our model. And we just don't know um, what that might look like yet. So great point, great, great and thoughts and we put it in questions. a special fund to... It's the exact same thing, except instead of... It, it, this was kind of going as far into the weeds of it and sharing my scary thoughts about how many buses would represent a logical pilot, but it can, you can reward say up to $800,000 to support ongoing transportation needs, leave it at that. And we're starting a matrix of different options to bring to bear to try to help the situation moving forward. Yeah. Appreciate it's a great. That. That, that's probably a better way to work. Yeah. Probably a better wording. Yep. I yeah. mean, again, like I love the idea, and I want to. I want to. I want to foster that kind of innovative approach. Um, and I think what Dr. Gurley, what I hear from Dr. Gurley, and what I hear from you is like, we kind of need to set aside some money for transportation needs next year. Yes. And uh, I would. This. That's. And I don't want to be shocked. <laughs> and I don't want anyone to be shocked if I come back saying we want to consider this minibus fleet. So it may come to you like as something to consider, but let's, we, we definitely need more information before anyone should sign off on a purchase order. I'll be the first to say that. So would, you would be comfortable if um, the recommendation were slightly amended oh, to absolutely. be a little more general about uh, allocating the money for transportation? I, I would solutions. appreciate it because I think it better reflects where we truly are okay. in the planning process. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Are we ready I think to so. make that? I think so. If somebody would like to make a motion for this. Yeah. I, so I'll move that we transfer $1.15 million from the projected FY22 year-end funds from the general fund to designated programs and grants in the special revenue fund to support safety and security projects in um, up to $800,000 for transportation needs. Uh, second. Yeah, I would only I would only say if you could say up to 1.1 million. Can we up just to, be clear that the 1.15 is the total of those two is, things? Right. It is mm -hmm. not yeah. in addition. It is. Right. Yeah. So um, do you want to I mean do you want I will train I I'm going to move that we transfer up to, which I think I said before, 1.15 million from project projected FY22 year-end funds from the general fund to designated programs and grants in the special revenues fund. I'm not second. Wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, paused. Yeah, I know I did. Um, so up to $350,000 for safety and security projects and up to $800,000 for anticipated transportation needs. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I just said for everybody too, I just wanted to make note, I don't know if other board members saw that there's a um, school division who is actually closing school early a week because they don't have bus drivers to finish out the year. So I do wanna just again, extend gratitude to our bus drivers and to all who are helping and all parents 
who are driving as well. So thank you. All right, now we have um, discussion items. We will have um, our preschool update. All right, good evening again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Uh, next, we will have Sheila Sparks, our coordinator for preschool and family support to share with you an update regarding our CCS preschool program. Ms. Sparks. Thank you, Dr. Odie. Good, e good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Gurley, school board members. It's my pleasure to be here this evening to talk with you about our Charlottesville City Schools preschool program for our three and four-year-old learners. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about the enrollment update for this current year and for next year. We're gonna talk about some highlights of uh, some new programs we have going to um, support families with coordinated enrollment, and some updates around our three-year-old programming that we have, some was out of necessity due to COVID, and we'll talk about that, but it's been a blessing in the long run to help support our youngest learners. The statewide Virginia quality birth to five-year-old um, work that is being done across the state, but also here in Charlottesville City, the wide array of partnerships that we have in our community and some new initiatives and some of our next steps that we have moving forward. So on May 23rd, I pulled the data uh, for our current enrollment. And when you look at this, you'll see data for our three-year-olds and our four-year-olds across all six elementary schools Plus you see the mixed delivery, that's the MD um, down there at the bottom. And I'll talk more about mixed delivery in a moment, but those are children that we um, are helping fund placement um, with some of our private provider partners in our community. Um, so as you can see here, we have um, at the bottom, we have total enrollment. We have 234 three and four-year-old children that Charlottesville City is helping support through VPI, the Virginia Preschool Initiative Funding. Um, and the state has um, allotted us 247 slots. So we are, um, we are almost at capacity in those um, classrooms. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, if you would, please. So this slide, I pulled it on the same date. Um, and this is looking at next year. So this is looking at applications for next year. So this is what we've been working towards since January when we opened up application. Um, and so you see for four-year-olds and for three-year-olds and then for the subtotal, you'll see accepted and pending. And those are accepted means we have everything we need to accept a child for placement for next year. Pending may mean that we need a proof of address, proof of income, uh, or some sort of documentation still that we're still working with those families. Um, so you'll see that the numbers, um, if you look at the state allotment, is 229. That is down a little bit um, from this current year for this next biennium. Um, across the state, the um, state allotment for VPI has gone down for four-year-olds across the state. Um, and when I asked about that, um, the birth rates across the state of Virginia have gone down. And so they are, um, they have adjusted that down to um, try to match that. So we are um, right now, if I say that all those pending families are going to be accepted once we get all the needed documentation, you'll see that we are within 17 slots right now. Um, of being full, and I can tell you being in the preschool office over the summer, we get families all summer long that we are working with. So I fully expect that we will be right on point as far as um, being full next year. Next slide, please. During COVID times, we had to quickly shift 
as you know, in education, all educators were shifting very quickly, but for preschool, all that happened right when we were in the middle of our application um, window. So we were, we had to shift pretty quickly, but it really was um, an area of growth for us. It was allowed us to take our application online. We were already working on that. So we were ahead of the game um, on that, pro that part of the process. We also um, were working together with our partners for, in Charlottesville and Albemarle, uh, particularly to have that coordinated enrollment effort. So that would be Charlottesville, Albemarle, Head Start there at MACA and, and our other community partners there, Barrett and YMCA, Java Shining Stars and Foundations who are private partners in town. Those, um, we have worked together with them to make sure that every single child who is eligible to receive free preschool um, is able to have a family choice as to where they wanna be placed. Um, Cause that was really, really important to us. We want every family to feel like they are able to make that choice where their child goes, whether it's their home elementary school, whether it is um, a private center, whether it's MACA Head Start, um, we wanted to work with families to make that happen. So that, that has been a, um, it's been hard because it, there's a lot of people involved, but it has been um, very worthwhile to see families getting to make the choice. Um, and as early as recently as this week, I have been making, you know, I talked with a parent, wanted a different decision, and I was able to flip the switch to make that parent's request happen. So that's been really important, I think, for a lot of our families. So if there are any families out there that still need preschool, go to grow.com, that's where you go to apply. Another highlight has been, and um, Kim Powell and Sherry Eubanks from Transportation and I had a conversation uh, back during COVID times and we had this conversation around um, what we were gonna do with three-year-olds and how their school day was going to be. And they said, Sheila, I don't know how we're gonna do a separate three-year-old bus run. And they said, is there any way that they could ride the bus with the older kids? And I said, yes, because that means they get a full day. Because um, it used to be, if you recall, nine to 145. So now three-year-olds are at school, a full school day, just like our other elementary kids. So they're getting a full school day, um, which is huge for our kiddos. Um, it's huge for our families as well, because they're allowed now to, or they're able to, get their, all their kids off the bus at the same time, as opposed to trying to navigate two different morning times, two different afternoon times, and it allows much more flexibility for families for work, which has been great. The other uh, point that we, with the, with the transportation uh, shift of all children being in um, the school the full day, we also made this, the change that every child was gonna be in their home school because previously our, our three-year-olds were only in four of the six elementaries. If you recall, we have five designated three-year-old classrooms, but they were only in four buildings. Um, with this change, we were able to have, I'm gonna say 99% because we do have a few children for different reasons that are not in their home school, but 99% are in their home school. So there are some, there were, previously we would have children who would be in one elementary school for a three-year-old, shift to their home school for four-year-old, and then kindergarten and forward. Now they're not making that change. So they technically could be in the same school for up to seven years, um, which is pretty powerful when you think about um, nobody's in one school for seven years in, in any um, building anymore, it seems. So that's been a really powerful um, shift. Um, and the other thing I just wanna highlight is the um, respect and prioritization that happened around transportation for preschool. Um, and I really, uh, Kim Powell and I had a phone conversation about this and on a dime, 
she made it happen. So I, I want to really applaud uh, Kim when all of COVID was happening, because that really was a, um, a turning point, I think, for a lot of our preschool families um, as we moved forward during COVID times. Because we did not let anything get in the way of our little ones getting to school. So across the state of Virginia, if you've been watching the early childhood um, sector, there's been many changes. One of the big things that we have been working toward over the past few years is the Virginia Quality Birth to Five. And this is the way that it, it's not accreditation. It's not um, that kind of work. It is work to make sure that what is happening is the right work and that it's high quality. So there are two big components to this. One is teacher-child interactions, that they are high quality. And the second is um, curriculum, that we have a high quality vetted curriculum. So two things. One is um, class observations, which is the um, about the teacher-child interactions and how those interactions are happening in the classroom, that they're positive and the child feels safe and secure in the classroom, as well as child to child and teacher to teacher, adult to adult in the classroom. Um, so we wanna make sure that every child is in a really positive environment because we know based on research that those interactions and high quality curriculum are two of the big equity levers for any early childhood classroom. So we will be working, we have been working on those uh, two components. That up to this point, it has been a, a um, pilot. They've been practice years. Next year, it will become, um, it'll count, so to speak, um, and it will become public information. Up to this point, it has been practice. Next slide, please, Leslie. So for the instructional tools um, for pre-K teachers, as I said, curric curriculum was one of them. The creative curriculum we've been working with for three years now. It is one of the, and it was the original um, vetted curriculum through VDOE, um, and it is research-based. It does cover you know, math, science, language, literacy development, but it also addresses social emotional skills and cognitive skills. So those things are um, all a part of that. It also has a component which has been one of my favorite parts is the data collection and observations that are made of children with their everyday learning and play that's happening in the classroom because we do feel like every moment that they're there, they're learning. Those synapses are, are connecting and we wanna make sure that that is documented and that's how we measure growth, that's how we measure what's, what they're learning in the classroom. Next slide, please. Some other resources that we use in preschool, and this is to help connect and bridge that gap between preschool and kindergarten. Um, I have put some pictures there, but, and have a list there, but the Hegarty's Phonemic Awareness Daily Program, Handwriting Without Tears, um, which really works on the fine motor skills. It also works on letter recognition and letter development um, and developing math concepts in pre-K. And then second step, which is our social emotional learning. This is um, really to help bridge the gap and making sure that there's that continuity between preschool and, and kindergarten. I mentioned earlier the teacher-child interactions. Um, the tool that we use is the class tool. It's classroom assessment scoring system. And these observations are done twice a year. Each observation is about two to three hours long. Um, those are four 15 minute segments each time, but there's time in between. And then, you know, there's time where they're doing some sort of transition and we leave that time out, but we do have certain requirements around that. It's pretty intensive um, because you're scoring them in 10 different areas and then you're giving a feedback report 
with the scores, and then there's a coaching session afterwards. So it's pretty intensive. What I have kind of ballparked is that it's about an eight hour day by the time you do scoring, write the report, and then do feedback and, and coaching. It's about an eight hour day. It's about a work day for each observation twice a year. These observations have been completed by myself, by Rachel Rasnick, who is the Early Childhood Special Education Coordinator, and the six um, instructional coaches at the elementary schools, we have pulled them in to help support because they can do ongoing daily support as needed. Um, each of us trained for two, at, two days, plus had to take a pretty intensive reliability assessment, and that has to be completed every year. And there are some people who have struggled with that test, even though you get three chances. So it is a pretty intensive. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is that we, we focus on Rachel and I and the instructional coaches doing it because we do not want this to be evaluative in terms of human resources and hiring, firing, that type of thing. We want it to really be formative for the teachers to help with their um, teaching and learning and what's happening in the classroom with those interactions. So we have been very intentional to keep that um, out of the supervisory uh, role. They have their own process that they do. Next slide, please. We have many partnerships that have uh, supported our initiatives um, in the early childhood program. We are working very closely with JMU TTAC around in inclusive placements for preschoolers. Um, and for our, we are the uh, Charlottesville City Preschool Program was the inaugural um, pilot for early childhood BTSS. Um, so we were the very first. We were working on those two initiatives and had just kind of gotten rolling. And then the COVID shutdown happened on March 13th, 2020. So we had to hit pause for a little bit. Um, and then we kind of came back together and we are, are working on that now. We also have um, other organizations that we work very closely with, United Way, the Albemarle um, Department of Social Services, Albemarle Public Schools, Charlottesville Department of Social Services, obviously Charlottesville City, MACA Head Start, Ready Kids, and the Children's Health Partnership. Um, we all work together on that coordinated enrollment and mixed delivery where we're placing children in a variety of places. So that has been very intensive work. Many of us joke that we saw each other more than we saw our spouses or the people that we live with in our home, our children, um, because we were spending hours and hours and hours daily together to get those two programs up and running. Another special partnership, which um, Charlottesville City has always been a um, wonderful partner with, um, is Wild Rock. Wild Rock, um, we were one of the very first school divisions um, five years ago, I believe, to get started with Wild Rock with our preschoolers, where we were doing field trips twice a year for every preschooler for both years, three-year-old and four-year-old. Um, and then they were coming to the school before and after each field trip. So they were getting six touches, if you want to think of it that way, with nature um, and that the learning that can happen from that. Again, COVID hit, so we had to, we had to shift and Wild Rock was really amazing in continuing those in-person visits that they could do at the school because as we were talking about earlier, transportation and Field trips is, a, is an obstacle for us right now. So this was a way that we could continue that partnership with Wild Rock uh, to help support our children. Because if you've never been to Wild Rock, I'm happy to organize a, a field trip with anybody who hasn't been. It's an amazing place that um, is really um, good for the soul. Um, so I encourage you to go. If you have not, let me know. I'm happy to arrange it because um, it's a great place to go. And if you haven't been with three and four year olds who've never been out um, of Charlottesville, because you know we have many kiddos, I mean they they're not used to just being able to run free and not have to worry about streets and and those kind of things. It really is an amazing experience to watch them see mountains, see cows. Um, 
it really is a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, and I think our last slide, um, we have been onboarding a new um, early childhood student information system. We'll start that in July. There's a partnership in Roanoke that we are gonna be modeling after. Um, to have the student information system that will dovetail with our Charlottesville City student information system. And we will have one of Mr. Cuomo's uh, team um, on that uh, partnership with us to help guide us to make sure that we're, we're working together on that. So we'll start that in July. One of the other um, next steps is kindergarten and preschool teachers are gonna be training for handwriting without tears. It's been a few years, I think it's been probably six years since we've had an official training with that. The part that I really like about this is that we're gonna be partnering with PrEP and the occupational therapists, and they're gonna be doing ongoing training with the teachers and instructional assistants in those classrooms on how to build those fine motor skills. Because if you've ever seen the, the development of hands of a three-year-old compared to a five-year-old, it's very, very different. So we've got to build some muscles um, and, and let their little hands develop. So we want to make sure that we're, we're doing Play-Doh and we're doing, you know, those things that are really going to build uh, fine motor development so that they are ready when we're asking them to actually do writing. We are uh, going to be using the information that we get from Teaching Strategies Gold, which is our online data collection from the curriculum. We're gonna be using that to really work on delineating our tiers for early childhood, just like we do for VTSS for K to 12. We're really gonna be laying that out um, through our pilot with JMU uh, TTAC for VTSS. So we're gonna be working on delineating that out and being very intentional and data-driven. Um, and then of course, I have to plug the Early Childhood Center. Um, looking forward to to that um, experience. Um, and I also want to just give a, give a shout out to the early childhood teachers and, and instructional assistants. They have been um, absolutely phenomenal. They really um, are some of the hardest working, uh, most passionate teachers I've ever seen. Um, through COVID, the, the extra steps and extra miles that they went were just phenomenal. And, they love these kiddos just like they're their own. So I just wanna give a shout out and wanna thank you for your support of early childhood um, in Charlottesville City. Any questions? Thank you. Board members, any questions? Mr. Bryant, I'm gonna start with you since I can't really see you, but I know you're there. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I uh, just want to Thank Ms. Sparks for all the hard work that she does with that early childhood program, along with her teachers and instructional assistants and all the other players um, that, are, that are on the team, because um, early childhood is the foundation. This is where it all starts. And um, you all are doing a phenomenal job, great programs and partnerships in our community. And you, you're setting the tone for what's to come later on down the pipe. So kudos and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else questions? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I have the uh, privilege of being on the, uh, the preschool steering committee, committee or task force, whatever it is, yeah. committee. And, you know, so I've really had a chance over these years that I've been on that to see the changes and particularly, you know, the, um, the really enhancements to the quality of our curriculum in, um, in, for our three and four year olds. And it's really remarkable um, just to see how robust that curriculum is. And, um, and also, you know, just how much work is being done on like these teacher observations, just to make sure that, um, you know, our program is really um, implementing the quality standards, uh, both in the curriculum we use, but also particularly in the, in the teaching. 
of these kids. And I think we are doing a, a terrific job. And um, like Mr. Bryant said, it, it is the foundation and it's really important, an important piece, you know, of our desire to address some of our equity issues and achievement as these kids go forward in the division. So uh, thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you. You've been a great supporter over the years. So thank you for that. I have a question about enrollment. I know you said there were 13 unfilled spots this year. Um, I would imagine we want to maintain some ability for students moving into the district throughout the year, but 13 still does feel pretty significant. Um, and so just if you can talk me through um, that those enrollment decisions and how many unfilled spots you're comfortable with. Well, and I will tell you, historically, we had, um, there are two different ways to look at enrollment. We look at the VPI funding and we look at seats in a classroom. One of the things that we have done is we have um, been able to include our early childhood special education students um, and the funding for those students who are placed in those other classrooms as well. So when I, when I talk about there being, there being a gap or there's um, in the enrollment, I will also point out that we only had a hundred, historically we only had 60, six zero, um, three-year-old slots. So we're actually, you know, we're up, we're over the amount, because we have funding for 90. I have 91 children, so I'm actually over, because typically we would have only had 60. So in the past two years, we've in, increased that number, which is why there's a little bit of a gap. Um, and so typically we had 160 four-year-olds. The other piece to that is that there are many families um, who still are not comfortable. We've had many families who have opted to keep them home or in a smaller setting um, because they're not vaccinated yet. So I think that has been a, you know, a factor for many families. Um, and I, if I would look at the enrollment for the previous year, I don't have those numbers with me, we're definitely up from where we were the previous year, 2021. I'm sitting here searching and I can't find it right now, but I was wondering if you had heard, someone had mentioned to me that I believe um, the governor or VDOE had offered some type of kindergarten readiness program for the summer where they were offering um, a laptop or something mm -hmm. like that to families. Mm -hmm. Do you, Can you speak to that? Yeah, that uh, program, it's through Waterford, I believe is the, is the company. Um, and they have a, an online, a program that would be an online summer program. They're giving out so many, um, they'll send the family a laptop. Um, and if they complete the, the program, they get to keep the laptop. Um, and so I don't know the specifics of what exactly it's covering, but it is something that we are um, sending out to families so that if they wanna take advantage of that, they can. So we are sending that out? Mm -hmm. In newsletters, yeah, thank you. We did, um, Madam Chair, receive a superintendent's memo about this program, Waterford, like um, Ms. Sparks said. And so we're sharing it with incoming kindergartners and uh, Ms. Sparks has received it. Our reading, excuse me, literacy specialists, math specialists, and our principals have received it. So we're getting that word out. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you so much, appreciate you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, now we will have Dr. Ode come up to introduce the local plan with Dr. Fouts. Okay, uh, good evening again. At this time, we would like to share information with you regarding our gifted program, annual review and evaluation. Dr. Jeannie Fouts, coordinator of gifted programs, ESL and AVID will present these documents to you at this time. Good evening. Madam Chair, members of the board and Dr. Gurley. 
This evening, I'm here to share highlights of our gifted program evaluation, um, which provides us necessary feedback to create our annual review and highlights both our accomplishments and our challenges um, this year. I want to begin by thanking um, members of our gifted advisory committee, as well as Dr. Kraft, our school board um, representative for their ongoing support. I also wanna thank the gifted resource teachers who helped gather information so we could answer our most pressing questions. The goal of this program evaluation was to learn more about the strengths, weaknesses, and achievements of the program in order to set new goals for next year as we continue this new pathway of gifted education. In this presentation, I'll highlight some of what we learned from the evaluation, and you also have more detailed descriptions um, of both the program's achievements and challenges in your annual review. Um, our goals for the program focus on three different areas. So the first is identification of students. On the left, you can read the program goal, which was created based on the 2021 to 2024 local plan for the education of the gifted. In evaluating this goal, we asked, is there equitable representation across subgroups of students identified for gifted education? Um, our data from the end of last year shows that there is, and, and we're currently in the process of finalizing our um, identification data for this year. Um, considering the identification process, we asked, is this process consistent across schools? Um, one way we keep things consistent is through written procedures of our um, identification and through a data analysis and identification meetings that happen at each school. Um, and those consist of, those have our gifted resource teachers there, our principals and classroom teachers as well. The second area of focus is our elementary services. You'll see in the annual review a detailed list of both accomplishments and challenges, and I'll highlight a few here. So again, our goal is there on the left. Um, for our evaluation for this question, we asked, are, our, are all of our stakeholders satisfied with the current state of the gifted program? And a note before we go further, um, while we gathered information this year, we didn't gather formal information from teachers. So you'll see a lot from students and from um, parents. And so um, our focus for next year will to be gathering more uh, formal and informal feedback from teachers. So you can see in this slide, um, the survey that we sent out to our K-4 parents and we had 67 um, parent responses. Um, so that's a small group of parents, but it's a pretty good, um, representation of the different elementary schools. And for our um, students, we had excellent participation with our third and fourth grade students, um, and their input was really essential. It helped us really understand the program on a whole and what was happening in the classrooms. All right, so when asking our parents about their perception of the gifted program, um, neutral received the most votes. And, and just to remind folks that this is the third year that the gifted program has been implemented in its new form. Um, and as the pandemic has also greatly affected our implementation, but um, just as it's affected schooling on a whole. Um, but I wanna remind everyone that, that the shifting of the gifted program um, from that original pullout model to a push-in model where all students are receiving services, um, that's, uh, sorry. Um, I, I, had, I had better words written here than I just said, so now I'm, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna reread this because I, I think this is important. So um, we really wanna make sure that all students are expected to engage with rigorous instruction scaffolded to their unique needs. And that's a huge shift from gifted programs across the country. Um, so shifts like this take a lot of work in order to help all stakeholders understand not only why this change is made, but also its benefits. And um, as a gifted program, we'll continue to work towards building that knowledge across the division. All right, so when we asked our third and fourth graders what kind of lessons they enjoyed, you can see that over 86% of them said challenging and somewhat challenging. And I think that this is really important because one of the structures of talent development is that you're, you're thinking about where children are and you're pushing them towards meeting higher goals. And that's not gonna work if our children aren't ready for that and comfortable with it. And so I think that this kind of gives us a glimpse of the, ch the children in our third and fourth grade classrooms are excited and ready for this challenging work. Um, this was an open-ended question, and I'm not sure. 
Can you all see the talk? So it, was, it asked something, I can't, what was, um, ex, like, what was something they're really excited about with their gifted resource teacher? And then you can see out of our 500 plus students, a variety of different um, words, but the words that are bigger are the ones that they said over and over and over. So um, what came out a lot was that it was fun, they enjoyed their math time, their poetry, their games, their learning, and that they appreciated their teachers. Um, in the annual review, you'll see more details about what some of those extensions might have looked like. All right, for the parents, we asked them what was um, the best parts of the gifted program. And these responses um, align with the reasoning behind changing the gifted model in 2019. So if we know the gifted programs have failed to equitably identify uh, students across race and class, and we know that providing opportunities for students to excel is important, then moving towards a, a talent development framework where all students are being served um, and given that inclusive responsibility or that inclusive opportunity is really important. All right, so our third area we focus on in, in our evaluation is secondary services. And for this, we also did a um, survey with our Walker and our Buford parents, and we had a little bit more participation um, at Buford than at Walker. And with our fifth through eighth grade students, we surveyed them as well. And there's the goal on the left. And um, so some of the goals for our gifted program this year were specific to Buford. But when we looked at things on the whole, it made more sense to have to talk about Walker and Buford together because Walker's program fits a little bit more aligned with Buford's than it does the elementary. So I'll be talking about both in this. Um, so for this goal, we asked what instructional practices are being put in place to meet the diverse needs of the students. Oh, we can go one back. Sorry. Um, okay, now you can go, sorry. So you can see here, we asked both parents and students the same question. So the parents are in the light blue and the students are in the dark blue. And remember that our parent responses were around 100, while our student responses were a little bit over 500. So some of the differences in the responses might be due that we had, we had a more representative group when we were asking the students um, than the parents. Um, so if you look at the students, nearly 50% um, of our students reported that the level of challenge in their class was just right, while a bit over 20% reported that it was sometimes too difficult or sometimes too easy. And so this is something that we can, as a, as a division, can think through when we're working with teachers about how to um, continue to support differentiation. And this next um, question we asked was about um, interest and engagement in the, um, in the language arts and math classes. And again, you can see that this data, um, we can use this data con to continue to develop our um, program. Um, we did not have a specific goal surrounding communication of the gifted program, um, but we did try to communicate in a variety of different ways. At the K-4 level, we had quarterly newsletters, we had gifted um, updates through 5.8, and then some of our schools used Twitter posts. There were also some website updates. Um, but I highlight this because of the next slide. Um, when we asked our parents, did they know who to contact with questions about the gifted program? You can see at the K-4 level, we had about 64% of parents say yes. But at the 5.8 um, level, we only had 9% of parents. So um, I thought that this was important to share with you because we can take that feedback and think through. So, we know how we communicated this way this year. What are some things we can do differently next year? And then our final area of focus in the evaluation was professional learning. So first we looked at both the professional learning of the gifted um, resource teachers and then also the classroom teachers. For this goal, we asked, um, how has professional learning impacted gifted resource teachers instruction? And as a division, um, we've been working to better understand EduClimber, which is a tool we use for data vis visualization to see different thing, aspects of how students are doing in the classroom. And this is really important for our gifted resource teachers to understand because it helps them monitor our student growth. And the current local plan for the education of the gifted focuses on building teacher capacity. And so for this goal, we asked, how are our gifted resource teachers assisting and supporting classroom teachers with differentiation? Um, this looked different across schools and grades, but our gifted resource teachers help when, with professional learning communities and with planning meetings. They also co-teach lessons. 
or model lessons. And then they also um, offer one-to-one -one teacher support, which could be through emails or conversations or um, just questions in the hallway. All right, so in closing, I just want to thank you all again for your support of the gifted program and for taking an innovative approach to support and extend learning um, for our students at Charlotte's Fifth City Schools. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. Any questions? Roshonda? Hello, thank you for the presentation. I just had a quick question. I um, understand how the gifted program works in the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how it's different at the um, upper elementary school and the middle school and the high school, um, or if it's the same? Sure. I just don't understand how it translates. Yeah. So at Walker, um, that this past school year there were two. There was two teachers, a math and a um, literacy teacher. So it worked similar to the elementary schools, except that um, most of the, well, pretty much all of the time when the teachers pushed into the classroom and co-taught, I don't think that at Walker, there's as much of an understanding from the students about that it's like gifted resource time versus at the elementary school. I think that that term is used a little bit more. So it's more that this, I think there's less of an understanding from the students. Um, and then at Buford this year, we had um, just one designated gifted resource teacher for math. And so she worked with English language arts as well in terms of like organizing and different projects that they did, but she was pushing in most of our pre-algebra classes. So um, those are the, the bigger difference, like the main differences, I think, to that. And at the elementary school, just if anyone doesn't know, there's two gifted resource teachers. One focuses K-2, and then one book focuses 3-4. Uh, do we have any um, local um, uh, expectations of this program that whether if we are we going to how do we define a success here? I understand how the state does based on all of their reporting. Um, but I just wonder how we are defining this success. Um, and I just encourage us to have that conversation regularly, not that I need an answer right now. Um, I just, I can't, you know, obviously I've been involved in gifted education in Charlottesville for more than a decade. And um, at this moment could not really, I understand what's happening at the elementary level, but I, you know, I don't know if we have goals for like having algebra for eighth graders for 90% of our kids, or if, you know, where we are in ninth grade reading levels, things like this, I just, um, exploring what it means for us to be successful in this endeavor, I think is a really critical component to what, uh, to uh, providing um, this as a springboard for some other divisions to use and to model, because obviously the gifted program is deeply flawed um, previously. And so I wanna be able to define success, how we're measuring it, and so that it can be replicated. I mean, not that replication is my goal. I'm just, just want everybody, <laughs> my goal is inclusivity and, and more people being able to access rigorous enriching curriculum, but. And I, I think we, those are a lot of the things that we talked about in our planning meeting for the presentation for this, mm -hmm. um, for this board meeting that we came away with a lot of next steps in terms of um, things that we could take back to the gifted advisory committee um, mm -hmm. in terms of you know, how do we quantify as we move forward? And and we also, at, in, in a lot of our conversation, we kind of delineated also that, um, you know, like the path to, is the path to accelerated math, is that gifted? Um, because we know that some of the students are talented um, and wouldn't fall under that traditional gifted model. So, you know, being able to have those indicators along the way, those were some of the takeaways that we also had that, um, that I know Dr. Fouts will be working directly with the um, Gifted Advisory Committee as we continue to build this program. And I do think it should be a model that's replicated also. Yeah, because people will want to see, they see the great things that we're doing now and they're wondering, okay, so what does it all mean? And so that's really, 
you know, now that we have really had one whole year to do it because we've not, this is really the first year, even I know we talk about it's the third year, but it's really like <laughs> the first year of the implementation. So we get to use the feedback to um, inform our practices moving forward. Go ahead, Michelle. Sorry, I was taking it all in. And this is more thinking out loud like Ms. McKeever did. I guess my concern is I don't, we need measurable, we need to figure out what our outcomes are going to be and things like that. I guess the hiccup for me is that at the elementary school, it seems like there's, I can see where there's equity. I can see how that's working, but I just understand how we go from so many specialists at the elementary levels, like one for each or two for each school. And then when everyone comes together at Walker and Beaufort, those resources kind of dwindle down. And I, I'm, I don't know how many children at Beaufort are taking the pre-algebra. So I'm just, and I know we're just getting started. So I'm just thinking out loud, but at the higher grades, I'm not really seeing the equity or understanding, like I'm not seeing it there. And it might just be, I don't have all the information, but just thinking out loud, that's where my thoughts are. I can speak to Walker a little bit because one of the positions um, that, that Kim was talking about earlier never got filled the entire year. So that was, there should be four gifted resource teachers. And then the other one taught virtual school this year. So we had two this year, but there actually were four. And so that's a little bit different. And then I think the other thing to remember is as we get into Buford and the high school, we offer, we offer acceleration in a lot of different ways. And so you can take algebra as a seventh grader, geometry as an eighth grader. Um, and then once you get to the high school, our dual enrollment and our AP classes. So they do provide um, more options for students. And then also I think a lot of our electives, like our engineering classes and things like that. So I think sometimes we get stuck, we identify in math and in literacy, but there's other ways um, our ISTEM you know, program. There's other ways that we're actually pushing students um, for, and you know, working with their gifts and talents. But um, so I think that that's something we can we can continue to like maybe talk through and advertise better. Just Dr. Morris, no, Dr. Kraft. Well, um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> You know, one is, I, you know, I think that the survey results regarding uh, communication and sharing information at the uh, upper elementary and middle school, I think that's really important um, that that's, you know, that people don't understand it. I think just like you don't understand it, I think a lot of parents don't understand what's going on there. And I think that's something that we can really focus on more. Um, and then um, I would just encourage um, maybe other board members to, to um, go in and observe. And I found that, you know, I did it at the elementary level a couple of times. I went in and observed in a, in a class with a gifted resource teacher and a classroom teacher just observed lessons. And so it's, it's really helpful to really get a hands-on sense of what, what they're really trying to do and how um, how that gets implemented with the diverse array of students that we have. So I would just encourage that maybe for next year um, to have opportunities for, for board members who want to, to go in and, and do that. And some of the feedback we got from the gifted advisory committee was um, in those four committee meetings, having more opportunities to walk through lessons. We had one opportunity where a teacher presented a lesson and walked through it. Um, so we're going to make sure that that's part of the gifted advisory committee meeting each time next year. So you all are all welcome to come to that too. So you can see sort of what does it look like in the kindergarten classroom? What does it look like in a sixth grade classroom? I mean, honestly, I, I, I want, you know, I do think that, um, I, again, it's kind of the on the ground work that is the most important thing, you know, I know because like, you know, my kids are doing GRT, not at Walker, because how can you with two teachers work with 500 children? Like we have two kids, at, two teachers at Venable. That's, 
that's a, a lot to demand of our GRT teachers at Walker. But my point is, is I know how it's working at Venable. I think it's great. Like the kids are so excited when they come home after GRT, they have had, they can explain the lessons. They're really engaged about it. And I think that's, I just want to recognize that, you know, on the ground, the kids are super excited about those lessons. And it, it is definitely, um, you know, reaching them in ways I think that are unique because it's the whole class experience rather than just being like this little group of kids. So keep up the good work. I just want you to know that um, I, I, I do think like most of the iSTEM engineering, even some, I mean, I do math all the day, all the time because of, as a lawyer. And I just want you to know that I think the eighth grade math is critical. And for, if you guys, if, if our goal for our children is to graduate high school and have excellent opportunities in the future, eighth grade algebra is where it's happening. We all know that we can. It, and so growing the literacy around algebra for all of our students, I think would be a dramatic effect on inclusivity and success rates for all of our students. Um, and I just feel like that needs to be said. I understand that some aren't talented in that, but I think that should be our expectation that all of our students are able, are being taught and capable of high level math because it's going to be continue to be required in our world, just like foreign language, but that's a different subject. <laughs> Ms. Dooley. Thank you. So I just, kind of prickled a little bit at the idea that the secondary um, acceleration being our approach towards gifted and talented education. I just think very often acceleration and course selection has a result in segregation and separation of students. Um, and so to me, that really highlights the importance of the professional development components that you've identified where we're building capacity of teachers to be able to uh, provide gifted and talented acceleration to students across the board. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Walker students not knowing that they're receiving GRT services is pretty fantastic. Like that's kind <laughs> of the idea, right? Like that they can each, you know, that they're being challenged and they don't even know it, that it's something additional or, or mm -hmm. special. Like that's, that's the goal of what we would be providing to students. But I just didn't want it to go unsaid that you know, we talked a little bit about prereqs and directing students. And some of this is we're playing the long game, right? We're really just, as Dr. Gurley said, one year into this model. But hopefully, as our elementary students have more um, years of exposure to this, that we may see um, better representation in accelerated classes at the secondary level. But that's my two cents. Mr. Bryant? Um. I guess, you know, being that we are out of the pandemic and um, this is our first full year of, um, you know, completing this new model. Um, I'm hoping that we will continue to build on that uh, model so that all students across section, a diverse group of our students will continue to, you know, to accelerate in this new gifted model. I think, because sometimes I think we were in the New York Times article, that was one of the things we were deemed on in terms of this, it gets to be a separation at one point. So um, I am hoping, because I'm trying to sit and to visualize what does it look like on the secondary level in terms of our gifted model. And um, so hopefully next year I will come into some of the schools in you know the upper schools to see for myself, I'm a visual learner, so I have to see it, um, just to see if it's really working so that all of our students will get that uh, important enrichment. I think that's critical. Thank you, sir. Um, my comments, um, thank you for stepping into this. We appreciate having you um, in this role, Dr. Faust. But back to some of the survey results, I and mean, we talked a little bit about the communication and how, how to do that. But in looking at um, the data that you guys have as far as just the overall perception of the gifted program from parents, I'm just curious as to how um, if you've had the opportunity to figure out how you're going to tackle that. Because um, that's kind of a tough one. And I don't know if you broke it down. I mean, you have it here as far as their answers. But if you were able to break that down and to, and to see, um, say, if um, 
the very positive, you know, responses were from one school in particular, if you're able to look at, look at it that way. Or I didn't to see look one. school, but I did look grade level. And um, I think as to be expected, our elementary level, the parents were more comfortable. And then as we got to secondary, they were less comfortable. And part of that is because our families who have their children at secondary level know the, know the previous gifted program and maybe their students went through that and they understand that model. If you have a new kindergartner or a first grader or even a second grader, you've, you've never experienced the, the pullout model. And so there's less confusion because you understand our model, how it is now versus. So I, I think that's part of it is, um, is um, having more conversations with families who are, um, who are at the secondary level about about the changes. So that's, that's the first step. The communication piece is interesting because as a parent of two children at Charles Hill City Schools, I get a lot of communication from a lot of places. And so I think for us, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily that we, I think we didn't communicate enough, but maybe we didn't communicate in the right ways. And so thinking about, well, what maybe reading a whole two page newsletter is a little bit too much. Like maybe we need to think about, um, you know, when family, when the children finish a project, sending home a half sheet of paper. So that's what we'll work on in August, the gifted resource teachers is, I think it's less about, I think it's, it's more about like the, the modality of how that communication um, works. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, next we will have Dr. Odie. She will be doing 10.3 and 10.4. She'll give us virtual education first and then she will do the strategic plan update. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gurley, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Uh, tonight, I am going to give you another update on the virtual learning plans for 22-23. As you may remember, our last update was at our April school board meeting, and I just want to bring you up to date as to where we are now. Next slide, please. So our sum and substance is shown here. First, we will talk about our current CCS virtual enrollment. Then we'll move into where we are for virtual learning for 22-23. And finally, we will talk about what we're doing as far as moving forward into virtual learning for the future. Next slide, please. So here you see a slide that I presented in April that shows the number of students we had at our peak, which was 72 students. As a reminder, we monitored attendance and grades, engagement, completion of assignments to determine student success rates. And what we learned is that some students did thrive in virtual learning and some did not, as I shared in April. The difference here on this slide is that in April, we had 67 students that were enrolled in CCS Virtual. And here you see that we currently have 63 students and that change is due to some students returning back to in-person learning. Next slide. And you see here a graph showing where those 63 students are here in CCS, uh, grade five, and, and again, this graph, a similar graph was shown in April, but the difference here is grade five is reduced by one, grade seven is reduced by one, and grade eight is reduced by two students since our last update. That's the four students that are now back in person. Next slide, please. And on this side, you see the enrollments that we have in virtual Virginia, which is the way we are going. Um, so as of May 27th, these are the numbers. We had 17 students that are enrolled in virtual Virginia. And this graph shows the current grade levels. So 
For rising fourth grade, there are three students. For rising fifth, one student. For rising sixth, there are seven students. For rising seventh, one student. For rising eighth, three students. And for rising nine, two students. And uh, I mentioned at our last update in April that we were in the process of communicating with all families to make sure they were all aware of our change. And this is the families of the current CCS virtual students. At this point, all families have been uh, contacted and uh, we have 17 students. Uh, and those again are students that were demonstrating success based on those criteria uh, that we shared before. Some of the students that were demonstrating success have opted to return to in-person learning. That's important. I know we may end up with only 17 students in virtual Virginia, um, but we do have a deadline of July 15th in case some other families of students who did demonstrate success decide over the next month or so that they would like their child to go to virtual Virginia, uh, we would be able to add them to that 17 if, if they did in fact demonstrate success. Uh, we did end up with eight free slots. I shared last time that there were seven, I believe. We had eight free slots, which is good. That's good news. Uh, and so the nine that were not free as I mentioned before, we are able to use our CARES or, or ESSER ARP funds. That is, of course, those are one-time funds that are expiring. So this is a good time to be able to use them for um, our virtual option at Virtual Virginia for next year. And uh, as a reminder, uh, for those, again, the nine students right now that we are paying for uh, in those students that are gonna be in fourth or fifth grade, it's $4,550 uh, for those. And then for the sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth graders, it's $450 per student per course uh, for those students. So we'll use those CARES funds to cover that. Uh, next slide, please. So moving forward. As you know, our CCS virtual liaison, Paula Culver Dickinson, is retiring as of June 30th. So she's going to pass that baton um, for, for monitoring and supporting our virtual students at Virtual Virginia to Jessica Brantley, who is our um, coordinator for health and PE and virtual education. And Jessica Brantley is very well versed with Virtual Virginia. She, of course, has been the person who has been handling virtual Virginia for the few students at the high school that take some virtual courses that have been taking virtual courses before COVID. Um, also, uh, school counselors have been assigned con uh, accounts, uh, those that as needed. We don't, of those students, and I don't have this data in case you ask, but uh, all of the schools are not represented. There are some elementary schools that don't have any students going to Virtual Virginia. Um, but the schools that do have students going to Virtual Virginia, uh, their counselors have, been, have had accounts created for them so they can stay in contact and communication, know how the children are doing and provide support because these are still our students. And so we want to be able to support them and make sure they're successful in virtual Virginia. Uh, next slide, please. I did share already about the July 15th close date. A few other things as we're moving forward. Uh, these are just a few pieces I wanted to share with you about virtual Virginia um, and our partnership. Again, these students do continue to be our CCS students. They're our kids, and we are partnering and sharing them with Virtual Virginia at their parents' request. Uh, Virtual Virginia partners with families, and they partner with the schools. Uh, we are connected so that we can help the students to be successful, and we want to stay updated 
and informed about how they're doing. Uh, Virtual Virginia is going to be monitoring them the same the way that we have monitored during our CCS virtual year. Uh, they're going to be checking attendance, uh, participation, engagement. Students are going to be required to log in daily with cameras on uh, and complete their work, uh, it, synchronous or asynchronous work. And Virtual Virginia does recovery plans because you know, they're not new at this. And so they have plans in place to support children who do experience challenges. So they will support with recovery plans of students that fall behind and need extra help. They'll meet with the parents, they'll meet with Charlottesville City School staff to put this plan in place if needed. Uh, they, they just, it's a detailed plan that they have identified to help students in case they experience challenges. And um, I was just wanted to share some of the electives that they will have as options there, uh, art, world language, health, and PE, and some dance options. So that it will be limited as it was limited this year during CCS virtual, those options are limited, but they do have electives. And this is not on the slide, but I, I just wanted to mention a few things I believe that you had questions about last time, um, CCS, well, as part of the partnership, there are expectations of the school division. Uh, and, and so one of, some of those expectations are that the school division provides school counselors and um, local mentor teachers and uh, student services and counseling services, access to computers. So I'll be talking with Pat Cuomo to make sure we have access to computers for these 17 kids and uh, access to high-speed internet and uh, textbooks and course materials, all of these lots of things that, again, there are kids and we want them to be successful. So we're going to make sure that they have what they need to be successful there. And as I said last time, if a family has opted to have their child attend virtual Virginia and they are not satisfied or pleased or the child is just not doing well, away from a Charlottesville city community, a school's community or school um, personnel, guess what? We will welcome them back to our classrooms with open arms. Uh, we will welcome them back to our school buildings. Um, 504 plans, IEP, uh, ESL uh, supports, OT, speech, all of those things that we are as a school division are, are responsible for supporting these students with. So we're going to make, I'm going to make sure we're talking with all of the necessary stakeholders to have these processes in place uh, so our students can have what they need to be successful. And next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. So here again, you see the points that were covered. And at this time, I will take any questions that you may have. Ms. McKeever. Mr. Bryant. Um, Dr. Odie, um, you, um, you mentioned um, these 17 students. Um, will they continue virtual Virginia or will they stay in this program until they, the CARES money runs out? I, I'm we will need to. Good question. <laughs> we will reevaluate. We'll do the same thing that we did at the end of this year. Well, in the spring, not the end of this year, we reached out to those families that were in CCS virtual to see, well, we monitored to see how the students were doing. And then uh, if they were successful and if they are successful in virtual Virginia, we'll ask if they wanna continue in that um, learning modality. Now, as I said before, and as you all know, these funds are going to expire, I believe in 2024. And so we will have to really be thoughtful as to if we will continue this once these funds expire. Because as you could see, $4,500 $4, per child, mm -hmm. uh, it can get quite costly. And right now we're using a gift. Mm -hmm. And one yeah. of the other, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the next question was, will they continue in Virginia until they, until they are seniors? 
right now, well, if you remember, our CCS virtual program was for um, rising, it was for rising third through rising eight. We are doing rising fourth and we're con continuing to support the students that were successful in eighth grade so that they can be in ninth grade. But our, our virtual program did not go beyond that. Okay, so no. it ends in the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they have to transition back to in-person. That, okay. that would be our, mm -hmm. right now, that would be our plan. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Dr. Bailey, I'm sorry. And, and the you. other part is we would slowly be phasing out the the, uh, the younger students anyway, so we wouldn't right. be bringing in, so the number would cons, um, consistently be getting um, smaller. That is correct, yes. Mr. Morse, Dr. Kraft. Just one quick question. Um, um, I wonder if if we've had the experience of any of the, uh, you know, virtual Virginia instructors uh, flagging emotional or mental health issues, concerns in any of our students, since they are more isolated. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that we would be in communication with. We certainly want our children to be mentally well, and so we do. As as I mentioned. Our school division is responsible to provide counselors. So I, I take from that, that when we communicate with Virtual Virginia, they're gonna let us know if a child is struggling with mental. Have, have they let us know? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any of our CCS virtual kids in that program. And I don't know the answer to that for the okay. high school students that are currently doing Virtual yeah. Virginia. I can check with that. Thanks. But, I, but I would assume that they are and our counselors are well aware to support them. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll stay here for the next one, which is the strategic plan update. Okay. Um, as Leslie brings that up, I will thank uh, Beth Chuck and the former technology director, Jeff Faust, and all of those stakeholders that participated in the creation and implementation of our current strategic plan, which was set to be um, utilized for 2017 through 2023. So uh, next slide, please. Our sum and substance for this presentation is here. And welcome, Beth Chuck. <laughs> um, our, our sum and substance for the presentation is here. We have a reminder of our mission statement, every learner, every day, every one. We'll talk about our focus areas. I'm gonna share uh, some glows and grows with you. And then we'll talk about next steps. Next slide. I won't read all of this, uh, but on this slide, you will see, of course, what we at Charlottesville City Schools believe about every learner. Everyone's a learner. We foster a culture of learning. All learners can achieve at high levels, and we want to develop a passion for learning in all of our students and staff. Next slide, please. And here we are sharing what we believe about what every day means. Learning is continuous and meets all learners where they are, anytime and anywhere. And, you know, COVID tried to come in here and derail our plan, but we learned really quickly how to meet students' needs anywhere. So thank you to Pat and his team and all of our teachers who have done this amazing job during these challenging years. Um, and now for everyone, we believe that we, sh we share the responsibility for all learners. We are a team and we are accountable for everything that happens in our division. Next slide, please. So our focus areas, as you know, are, are shown here, academic excellence, 
safe and supportive schools, and organizational supports. Those are the three areas that our strategic plan has focused on over these five years. And next slide. So now what I'll do is guide you through some glows and grows uh, that we found based on the goals in each of the focus areas. And we've, we've had some uh, deep conversations about the strategic plan. And I will say, when we first looked and said, we've, we're gonna provide a strategic plan update to the board and we're not gonna show that we've done any of those things because of COVID and because of the unfortunate events of 2017 that happened right at the beginning of the strategic plan implementation. But as we worked as a team, um, we got various voices and input and did some activities to, to try to figure out what the glows and grows were. You will see as we go through this that the glows far outweigh the grows. So here um, for academic excellence, goal number one, CCS will develop life ready graduates. We've, we uh, narrowed down to three goal glows. There were more, but we, we chose a few. Um, the focus on the science of reading, huge. Um, providing opportunities at all grade levels for students to apply math concepts in real world situations and the creation of the iSTEM program. Those are some major glows that we've had for developing life ready graduates. Some of the grows, we do need to have more focus on work based learning to meet the criteria for college and career ready graduates. And we do need to continue the work on a closing achievement gaps. We have work to do. Next slide, please. Academic achievement, academic excellence too. Learning will be student-centered. Several glows. Uh, we, we learned a lot from the pandemic using technology, meeting needs. Um, career pathways uh, have been created that nurture students' interests. Uh, we have now have an emphasis on growth instead of just utilizing one data point but we do look at growth and all data to develop student-centered in, centered interventions. As you know, we've been focusing on inquiry uh, models, IDMs uh, to teach children in a different way, choice and critical thinking and problem solving. And we have a better implementation of VTSS and that brings tiered supports and resources to our students. A grow that we found there for this um, goal was that we don't wanna go back to normal, to one size fits all. Um, I always say, we don't wanna go back to normal. We wanna go to better. So we have to maintain what we've learned uh, so that our students can continue to be prepared. Next slide, AE3, learning will be equitable several glows there. We have created an equity supervisor position. I don't think she's over there anymore. <laughs> um, and a family engagement program. So those are two important pieces that have been a focus area for us. We have been expanding our unleveled classes, uh, which give kids, gives kids more opportunities. Um, we are teaching a more honest and inclusive history to our students. The redesign, uh, Dr. Fouch just shared about the gifted program. That's a glow. The redesign of our gifted program is bringing enrichment and creativity to all of our kids. And we are connecting CCS equity to, state, to the statewide framework. Some of the grows we have, again, uh, dealing with the gap, we still have to work on closing gaps. We wanna eliminate the gap between our impact and our intent. And we wanna continue work on the implementation of standards-based grading. We're not where we need to be yet. And then we go to safe and supportive schools. Go number four, next slide. Um, 
a GLOW, several GLOWs, implementation of the social emotional learning and classroom instruction, those SEL workers, the mental health professionals that we've added. Those are major glows, and we have better representation of diverse voices and perspectives in learning materials, programming, and processes. We're moving in the right direction. Grows, um, we still want to get better at VTSS. I had it as a glow a few minutes ago. We're, we're not where we need to be quite yet, uh, but we have it as a goal and a focus area. Um, we want to minimize discipline disparities. What we see is that so many of our brown and black children are those that are being disciplined. Um, so we have work to do. It is a grow. Safe and supportive schools, five, promoting physical health and wellness. A glow, um, our partnership with Wild Rock and Cultivate. Uh, we did have a silver, silver lining with the pandemic, and that was embracing outdoor learning and experiences. And, oh, here's a great one. We received a Governor's Scorecard Award for CHS in Buford for our wellness. A GROW um, building movement into student routines at the secondary level remains a challenge. We need to get our kids moving as they get older. Next slide. Safe and supportive school six, ensuring facilities are safe and conducive to learning. Glows, reconfiguration and modernization approved. That's a huge glow. Um, we've had renovations at Jackson via Clark and Burnley Moran. Security update upgrades are occurring. Uh, and we've got improvements in HVAC and filtering and purifying. So all great things that are happening for our schools, for our students. And then a grow, guess what? Re reconfiguration and modernization is approved. It's a serious, significant undertaking. So it is definitely a glow, but we know that there's work to do as we move forward in this process. Next slide, uh, recruitment and retaining excellent employees. Organizational support seven glows. Uh, we've been able to have virtual interviews. We had a wonderful in-person in job fair a few months ago. We are doing college recruitment visits. All of those are going to help us to recruit the best top candidates for to be before our kids. Um, we've had two 5% pay increases to remain competitive. Uh, the maintenance of strong benefits packages, including this new high deductible health plan and health savings plan. Great glows. And then a grow. Uh, we do continue to have a challenge of hiring and retaining people of color. So we have work to do. Eight, OS8, support and develop excellent staff members. Glows, uh, strong, flexible, ongoing PL that focuses on skill implementation. Uh, we are able to, we know how to create asynchronous and online options for professional learning. We, we were forced to do it, but we learned and we did it well because that's what we do. Uh, we strengthened professional learning in areas of cultural responsiveness. We're, we're, that's strengthen is the key word there. We're not where we need to be, but we are working towards the right direction. And we have new partnerships to build an IA, an instructional assistant to teacher pathway or pipeline. So that's really great. Grows, formalizing evaluation um, process for classified staff. That's something that we wanna do better. And we wanna provide further leadership development for current staff, and that includes teacher leaders, assistant principals, principals, central office staff. We want to be able to develop our leaders. OS9, develop and expand and modernize the infrastructure. GLOWS implemented the new business system, K-12, Serenic, Employee Central, and um, 
employee scheduling software time clock plus came in these five years. So those are some glows. Uh, investing in the private fiber network, that's a big deal. And movement to creating online processes such as this year, we implemented the online employee contract. So that is a great, great move in the right direction. Grows um, continued movement to online and streamline processes. We, there's still things that we need to do and learn to do and get better at. And our last one, OS 10, implementing knowledge management procedures. Glows there, using us employee central as a centralized hub for forms using Canvas, we had to learn how to use Canvas. We had Canvas champions teaching our teachers, we learned. Um, so that's a huge deal. Increased staff communication, such as the principal hub or staff emails. Um, Dr. Gurley sends out emails to staff, to community. Uh, so communication is great. And then grows, uh, we want to consider it an intranet or other tool to organize key information for staff. Next slide, please. So what we have found again is that we have many more glows than we do grows. And despite COVID and that unfortunate event in 2017, we have been doing some really good, important work here in Charlottesville City Schools. So our next steps are here. Since our current strategic plan was developed for 2017 through 2023, it is now time to begin the process of developing the new strategic plan for 23 through 28. So Beth Chuck uh, and, and was instrumental in the creation of the one, our current plan. Jeff Faust was part of that. We know that we have still Beth Chuck, we've got Pat, we've got other key leaders, and we're gonna be pulling together various stakeholders as we do to get input on what the, the data tell us, uh, what our strengths are, what our areas of need are, and we're gonna put together a new, um, meaningful, uh, thorough, strategic plan for the next five years. At this time, I will answer questions. Ms. Shumba, any questions? Mr. Bryant? No questions. Mr. Morris? Um, I have a question kind of relating to AE1 and AE2. Um, one of the grows was uh, for AE1 need more focus on work-based uh, learning to meet the criteria for college and career ready, uh, career ready graduate. But AE2 uh, glow was career pathways. And I was just kind of curious um, the thoughts of how those two are simultaneous um, or mutually um, how those two occur at the same time when I feel like they should feed off of each other. Yeah, uh, there are, you can come up too, there are new state requirements for work-based work -based readiness and we're just not where we need to be. Um, we know that that is a challenge for us. Now, we do have um, CTE courses. We have some pathways for students. And so I, I want to I say that's a glow because we have opportunities for our students to select, I wanna do urban farming, I wanna, whatever they wanna do, they can have a pathway, but we're just not where we need to be. Is there anything else? So, you know, I think that we had a couple of other ones that were like VTSS, we had it as a glow in one place and a grow in another. So we, we may be almost where we need to be, but we were recognizing and owning where we continue to have work to do. And specifically with the AE1, it's the work-based learning pro, it's the work-based learning component of it. So we have the pathways, but the, the having, um, allowing our students to have the um, internship opportunities out in the community. And that was a part of the grant as, um, that was a part of the grant, which we didn't get to um, fill that position, the, the uh, mentor piece. 
So that's the part we can work on moving forward. Right. Thank you um, for all of that feedback. Um, and then the next thing was AE3, um, eliminating the gap between our intent and our impact. Maybe you can just give a little bit more clarification. I think, um, you know, we're both in this plan and when you look at the plan that came after maybe a year or two later when, when um, Velvet Coleman was really instrumental in helping me do a lot of community feedback and developing our initial equity goals. If you look at any of these goals, you can see and you can hear from the community feedback that on the one hand, really good things are happening. And yet on the other hand, we're just not seeing the positive impacts that we need to see from that. And so I think goal by goal by goal, I think uh, Dr. Odie did a great job of just explaining, this is what we have in place. This is the tremendous progress we've made. And yet, if we were to go goal by goal by goal, looking at the outcomes, we're just not seeing the fruit of that good work yet. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate this process. And, and just to add to that, if you remember, one of, our, one of our other glows is that we are continuing to work to close the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. So we have put a lot of work into getting there, but we are not there. So, so we have a great impact uh, to, to close those achievement gaps. But when you look at our data at any given school, you'll see that our white students are outperforming our black and brown students. And so all of the work that we're putting in, we've had equity councils, we um, have, um, I think the year, a year or two before I came, there was a big push into hiring um, more minority teachers so that students see children of color leading a classroom, but we're still just not where we so that in, intent and impact there's a there's a gap there yeah. thank you uh, i guess the last quick thing is um as we kind of go through this process uh, i kind of hope that we um continue looking at the student voice um in the way that they have an impact on our community and within our in our buildings thinking about lma earlier um being able to to take their ideas and create with those ideas even when we were hearing about uh pre-k about um making sure that we measure uh, the kids in their term, uh, in terms of play, right? So to me, all of these things kind of line up in terms of play at pre-K, LMA, what they're doing right now. And then when we get to the work-based learning, I hope that we can tie that in to our strategic plan and keep moving forward on those three. Thank you. Ms. Dooley? Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. I mean, I. I... I think um, many of us, and I was just getting ready to jump into school board role when you got, when you and Mr. Faust were working on this, and, and it was a really intense and involved um, process. And I think you guys came up with a, a great strategic plan. I look forward to, and I know we, we've begun some discussion on, on you know, what we'd like this next one to be. I think uh, to Mr. Morse's points, you know, great um, feedback and thoughts regarding student um, voice and, and including them in there and and as far as intent and our impact um, and eliminating that gap, you know, just really probably narrowing um, what some of our goals are, you know, and, and really being able to dig in. I mean, I think I think we've done a fairly good job at identifying, you know, the, where we need to do the work and, and trying now to get everybody together to figure out how we can really make that change. Um, for our students. Um, so I appreciate you both and thank you. Thank you. All right. We now have 10.5. We have Ms. Powell with uh, School Safety and Security. Hello again. Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Gurley. So uh, this evening, I just want to review with you the elements of our security measures that we take in Charlottesville City Schools. And when you hear different security experts talking about the safety measures in schools and in really anywhere in any organization, they'll talk about a layered approach. And a lot of this is information you have seen before, but it's certainly understandable that with recent 
events in the, in the tragedy in Texas. It's something that everyone just wants a refresher on and a reminder um, and just an opportunity to talk and ask questions. So uh, you go to the first slide. So I have always thought about our safety and security ecosystem as having everything we do really in that regard falls in three categories, facilities and equipment, we hear people talking about hardening of security of facilities, things like that. Our practices and our procedures, and then our climate. And even though that is listed last, it is most certainly not least. Next slide. So with regard to our facilities and our equipment, one of the first major um, works that I'm familiar with here with the security equipment grant was the classroom security do uh, door locks project that was completed by um, Ed Gillespie before he left. And what that does is um, the, the locks on classroom doors, historically, um, they weren't a simple lock from inside like a push button because then there was too much opportunity for students to lock their teacher out of the classroom. And so what was typical was that you would, they were locked with a key put from the outside. And so what classroom security door locks do, you can actually lock them from the outside or the inside with a key. It's sort of that happy compromise, if you will, that um, enables you to quickly secure your room from the inside, but is not as simple as something that students could do if they wanted to be mischievous and lock their teacher out of the room. So all of our doors, throughout Charlottesville City Schools are the classroom security door locks that are considered best practice, um, best in class. So we have that. Next, all of our schools have what you would call the fundamental visitor management piece, which is you have buzz-in systems with cameras where the, you know, the person is buzzing in and, and someone visually identifies who they are before the door is unlocked by someone in the office. Um, the sign-in systems, once they get into the office entail running your driver's license so that the person can be background, you know, there's a little background check that happens with that and then the visitor stickers are issued. And then, so those first two pieces, the buzz-in systems and the sign-in systems, those are at all of our schools. The vestibules are a work in progress. They're being constructed um, as we go along, if you will. Um, there, we're down to the last few schools that, well, Johnson and Burley Moran um, those are constructed, but we're waiting for some of those access control components. And then um, Greenbrier and Venable and Clark still, no, not Venable, sorry, Venable's done. Greenbrier and Clark. Clark is a, not a tough solution to engineer. Greenbrier is tricky because of the way the school is configured. And what we're dealing with with vestibules, which is that additional layer beyond the buzz in, right? Beyond the visitor management once you get in, vestibules are another layer. And none of these schools were constructed when that was the standard practice. Of course, Buford and, and the new campus at Walker will all have best in class design with regard to how you know, people are introduced into the building and, the, and how the vestibules work. So I should clarify that you know, Buford, of course, right now doesn't have one, but it will. Um, so Clark would likely be the, you know, in addition to completion of Johnson, well, and CHS, we're doing some enhancements. They had a sort of visit vestibule with a lobby, but we added an additional door in front of the stairs on the left. So these things are, it's not anything that's ever stopped. The work has been constant. The grant has supported some of it. Some of it, we just have had to proceed with small cap funds without the grant funding just to keep going. Um, building wide access control. So that's moving beyond the buzz-in systems at the front door and putting all of the doors on some level of access control. And there's two levels with that. With access control, you have some doors are what are, are full access control, meaning they have a reader and there's a fob that you can go in through that door. Some doors are what are called monitor only. And that's a door that you can see the status of that door from a centralized um, location, you can tell whether it's fully closed or not. And we're looking at actually adding enhancements to some of those like audible alarms if the door is not fully, um, if it's been propped, that kind of thing. Um, we're also, look, there's two enhancements there that we're working on. One is the audible alarm and the other is we, we have it where we're programming where you can get emails. If you're not watching the system, you could get an email that pops up, but we're looking at maybe an add-on where you can get a text, certain people could get text alerts 
if a door is not, if the door contact isn't completely closed. So there are enhancements that we're looking to layer on even with our existing um, access control systems. Um, video cameras. Video cameras are really important. Um, we don't have staffing to sit around and monitor cameras per se, but they're really important when things happen, whether it's something to persons or property. Um, video cameras can help, and they also can help with visual. One of the most important things is visual, being able to have facial level identification of people who are coming in and out of your buildings when you review video. Um, and also, if as staff allows, in certain circumstances, you can certainly watch things real time, but we don't have people sitting there just watching video. And I just want to be very forthright about that. But video cameras are a valuable tool in understanding what's going on around any campus. Glass enhancements. Those are like frosting, but also those additional film it, um, to make a glass. It's not, it doesn't make it impenetrable by a bullet, but it makes it, it takes longer to get through the glass. It's an additional level of film. And it, we made it a standard practice some years back to add that on any, anytime there's door replacements if, and it has glass in the door or around the door, we are investing in those, that additional film. And so any new glass that's been put in, um, we work with that and in places where there's glass issues, we can add it to that, add to the existing glass. And then the last piece is key control and management. This goes back to the big uh, master key project, which those type of projects always go really well hand in hand with access control, because as you put people on the fobs, which you can control centrally and deactivate if somebody misplaces a fob or they leave and they don't turn their fob in, um, it's really a great opportunity to really minimize the number of metal keys that are issued because people don't need them. They should all be working off of their fob or their badge. So um, all these things take time and resources and the action that you took earlier this evening to help us get ahead of the grant funding and the way that cycle is operating will really help us just continue steady progress and building out these systems. Again, the fundamentals, if, if all, the door, all the doors should be locked at all times during the school day. And we've got the, the buzz-in systems and the sign-in systems for visitor management. So as long as people aren't propping doors or being inattentive to that, that piece is in place. Adding in the greater sophistication with access control and all of that is just like belts and suspenders type thing to back up our, what our standard policies and practices are in the event there's a lapse or a human error whatever. Next slide, Leslie. So moving from the facilities and equipment, talking about our practices and procedures. Um, most of you, especially if you have kids at home, they come home and they tell you about all these drills, but there are quite a few drills that are um, required and some are recommended, but we have all of them in our crisis and emergency response plans. And the numbers in parentheses represent the number of times that these drills are either required or recommended per year. And we have um, forms, templates that the schools fill out. Some, some dates are prescribed, like the earthquake drill goes with the great shakeout, but other dates, we, there's some flexibility for the school to decide when they do them. They just have to do them within a certain time frame, and all of that's laid out on forms that we give the schools and they turn back into us. At the bottom of this slide is just something that I wanted to share for reference for families and when other incidents have occurred like the Parkland shootings, um, a lot of times when families are really concerned and upset, they end up being referred to me to, to talk with them about what do we do in Charlottesville. And I found after that incident, it was helpful to refer families who were interested to resources that they could look at and decide for themselves how they may or may not want to share that information with their, with their children. And so this particular type of um, framework there's multiple names for it. It's uh, another one is ADD, avoid, deny, defend. Um, but one that's the one that seems to get the most traction is this run, hide, fight. And this is the same training. It's not, it's not exclusive to schools. In fact, it's training that is done at businesses or places of worship. Um, it's very, very common. And I compare it to sort of a unfortunate life skill type thing like CPR, first aid skills that people with some of the events, with the events that happen today in society, these are the things that you can, you know, think about if you want to feel like you want to have some sense of what to do in these situations. Um, all of our administrators were trained in a version of this 
years prior to COVID, I think it was two years prior to COVID, we all went through what was at that time called CRACE training, civilian response to active shooter event training. All of the administration at that time had that training. And we, um, and now they don't even, the best practice is you don't refer to it as active shooter. You're actually supposed to think about any active threat. So now I guess they would call CRACE CRATE because it would be response to an active threat. Um, meaning someone with a knife or anything. Um, these are hard things to think about. I will tell you, I'm the first person to feel that way after different situations where I've sat through this training a lot. Um, it's hard. It's a hard thing, but it's also hard to watch it in the news. And so um, it can be helpful for some people, especially to just know that there are, it's hard to call it a best practice, but it's, it's the recommendations from the experts about situational thinking. And if you want to do that type of visualization and think about, well, what would I do? And, and people want answers, right? This is that, that website, that resource is something that for families to consider and for staff to also consider as a resource. And we are actually in the training materials that Mr. Lee is putting together for our staff with the continuous training that we do, we are going to make sure they're aware of that resource. We're gonna do another push around that just for anyone who wants to feel like they want a better perspective on how, how these things are handled or what the recommendations are from the experts. So the website there is ready.gov and it's public spaces. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, this is mentioned last, but it's certainly not least. And in fact, um, the experts, many of the security experts tell you this is, this is where to invest. And this is where Charlottesville, this is what Charlottesville has prioritized is working on climate um, our care and safety assistants, who are, who, they are certified school safety officers. They're an important part of our efforts around climate and in conjunction with security. We have conducted climate surveys beyond what's recommended by uh, DCJS or what's required by DCJS. We've done our own customized surveys. Those results have been shared with you so we can continue those conversations and see where we work, continue to work with our community to figure out what our areas of focus and improvement need to be. The social emotional supports for our students and staff, that's huge. And clearly the board has been very supportive in prioritizing that investment. Um, intentional community building goes along with that. Promoting the, the uh, if you see something, say something. Along with our culture of care, promoting if you see something, say something, that's, that's really essential. And then threat assessments. Charlottesville was one of the first localities to, um, you know, put the threat assessments in place in conjunction with the work with Dewey Cornell, who's a local expert, very heavily involved with Sandy Hook Promise. We're fortunate to have him here locally. And so we were one of the first uh, school divisions to work to, to implement threat assessments, which are now required throughout the Commonwealth. And I think other states have also made those man that, that whole protocol mandatory. So there's a quote here at the bottom that just, again, states that many security experts and educators point to a solution that is decidedly low tech, the relationships. The next slide, Leslie. And so safety, we, people wanna talk about it and need to talk about it. And they want answers when there are these tragic traumatic events in our world. But I think the number one thing we need to assure everyone is we never stop working on these things. It's, it truly is a, it is a perspective of continuous improvement. And again, thank you for um, putting the money aside as we have the opportunity now with this year-end outlook to allow us one that um, with regard to the physical side of it, we can just keep going with looking for common sense ways to improve that don't damage our climate, but help kind of put what I think of as the belt and suspenders approach in wherever it is you know, the practical and right thing to do. But we are doing the safety surveys, the inspections, the checklists, the crisis management plan reviews. Um, we have the climate and working condition surveys, and then we have our safety audits, and these things go on. There's a there's a a drumbeat, if you will, of annual, almost mo actually monthly things that go on in the safety year of a school. And this year, I want to give um, big props to uh, Mr. Lee. He is um, he came forward with this idea that we would have a, a safety it's called the Summer Safety Workshop or Work Session for all of our schools to come together. It's on June the 15th. 
and get our crisis management teams together with our first responders who we meet with monthly now. Mr. Lee's also been organizing that to um, just workshop through our crisis plans together and just give everyone an opportunity to um, not only work collaborate across the school division, but more closely with our first responders. And so I'm really excited that we're kicking off what I plan to be an annual summer work session every year. And I think we're, so one other thing that I want to take an opportunity to mention, this comes up a lot if you attend many safety trainings, is that the constant tension between convenience and safety. And I want to bring that up only because if, um, when you go into a school or, and you've um, got someone going in and the person, it's only courteous sometimes, right? To say, oh, let me, you know, come on through behind me. But there are things that we need to think about, like making sure that people stand back while the visitor's cleared and they go through so that the next person just doesn't come back, come right through with them. It's called passing the door. It's okay if you've got a classroom of kids going in through a door because they all know each other and they're a known group. But there are little things like that sometimes as you look to improve a, sa a culture of safety or like you don't have access control on a door, which means that's convenient to someone's classroom because that means they have to all go through to more of a, you know, to fewer entrances that are constantly being opened and closed during the day. That's an inconvenience to have to walk around the corner maybe to go in a more limited number of doors instead of having more easy access, but it's that tension between convenience and safety. And so, um, after a terrible event, everyone wants more safety, but then time passes and then people will be like, well, why don't I, why can't I, you know, fob in on this door? Why do I have to walk around to this other, you know, door? And so just be aware that that's part of the conversation and some, and part of the decision-making a lot of times is, do we make this more safe or do we make it more convenient? And just be, be we're very aware of that balance and um, sometimes it can be tricky, but we do the best we can and certainly safety is our top it needs to be and should be and is our top concern. Um, and this slide, you may recognize it because it was part of our safety model discussion. It really does take a village. Um, it's essential for the CCS community and the Charlottesville community as a whole to work together to maintain safe and supportive schools for all of our students and staff to thrive. It truly does take a village. And we've had t-shirts at some point during COVID that says we are the village and we believe that. It's one of the things that makes this a good place to be. Happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Dooley, Dr. Kraft. Boy, thank you for your attention to all of this. Um, you know, it's really important. And um, I have a couple of questions, but I just wanted to also say that I've taken the uh, run hide fight training three times now. Um, unfortunately, being part of synagogue, you know, I think that's become necessary. And it really takes multiple times. I, I would say for myself, it really didn't sink in the first time. And it somewhat sank in the second time, but I think it was this time where I finally, you know, understood it. And I would just encourage people to, um, if there are opportunities to do it, it once may not be enough to really um, viscerally understand um, the importance of, of that strategy. And to um, clarify, and as Dr. Kraft was speaking, it really is about situational awareness. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, run, hide, fight, avoid, <laughs> deny, defend, whatever you want to call it. It's about situational awareness and getting in the habit of when you're in a public space going, hmm, if something happened here, what are my options? And, and, yeah. and understanding that your best option is always to get away. Your second best, best option is to hide and, and barricade yourself away from the threat. And your third best option, if, you're, if you must, is to fight. And then what does that involve? And that's where you hear the different things about throwing canned goods if you're in a store or whatever. Um, yeah. Hard, hard things to think about that you kind of, just like an athlete doing visualization mm -hmm. before performing in a game, it, it, you, it's a choice to like, okay, can I put myself there mentally and think about these things? And is that what I want to do for, for, for my safety and potentially to help with the safety of those around me? It's not easy. Yeah. I had a couple of just specific questions. One regarding security cameras, video cameras. Um, 
I was hearing recently that maybe some cameras in one of our schools was not work, they weren't working and or nobody knew if they were working. And I'm wondering what kind of procedures do we have in place to check them and make sure that they are working and repair them quickly if they're not? Great question. So the um, situation that came up that I'm sure you're referring to, we actually had been, um, there were cameras that had been not operating in that area. And so we had, it, been, it had been upgraded and there were new cameras put in. We were still waiting for one part for one camera. It's a mount though, to get it out. So it gets us a better view, but all the cameras were actually operational. What wasn't working or the piece that caused confusion is they hadn't been integrated in yet with the portal that school level folks could view the video and retrieve it for themselves. Um, they, ha they had to request it from IT to get pulled because there's like a, a, a user interface that's in the building and they just hadn't been integrated with that interface, but we actually have video from that. So, and we check in the other end, we check the cameras, there's a routine for checking them okay. regularly. Um, but as we have been working, and I say we generously, like I do any of that work, it's really a portion of Pat's team, tremendous folks who are really stretched, but they are putting these cameras in place, make, made sure they were working, got pulled to something else and just hadn't done the integration to the building level, okay. to the soft, to the viewing software at the building level. We were absolutely able to um, pull video from his shop. So, and the lesson we learned from that is, well, first we, we told the school, hey, if just because you can't see it, call us. Well, we, we, we can probably pull it. And the second piece was, we're going to try really hard not to get pulled off a job until the integration is finished, even with the with the software there at the building level. So, and one other question, and I'm sorry, this is you know from the Uvalde situation uh, in Texas that just happened. But the question of who has keys, like if you know, like with law enforcement, people couldn't get in; they were waiting for keys. And I'm wondering in that kind of situation. Uh, who has keys? Do the police have so the, keys? The, so the certainly building administrators, custodians, and even in our present situation, the teacher master key goes a lot of places. Um, as we restructure and like less teachers, well, fewer teachers will need actual metal keys. Um, it'll be more like the principal and custodians, but then overriding all of that, and this is something we do have now, there's Knox boxes. Oh, which sure. um, fire and law enforcement access, and those are the top level masterpiece. So the Knox boxes are the short answer to that. Okay. But even without a Knox box, there's lots of people with well, that's really keys. Good but but the Knox box is really what we should also you know, think you. about as primary. Sure. Mr. Moss, no. Mr. Bryant. Um, Kim, I just want to say that thank you for. Um, updating us on all the school safety and security enhancements that you all are planning to do. Um, given the climate of the country, I think people are feeling a little bit more rested in knowing that we, but this is a continuous work um, in terms of making sure that as um, teachers and staff and students are safe in our buildings. And um, it's good to know that we will continue to enhance those, those safety measures. And I do appreciate you bringing it, you know, to the board and, and to the public at large. And thank you. Um, I guess I just have a few questions and a few thoughts, but the first question is about the vestibules. I've gone in through a few of them. It's the, is this, what's the security of the vestibule? Is it just an extra layer to get through? Because it is, it's a layer and it, depending on the school and the configuration that you have, one of the things that we're doing now is actually adding, um, we, you can add a, additional access control so that when you're in the vestibule, you actually get buzzed in again, but it's, a, it's about two things. It's about visual, making sure you're really getting a good visual ident identification on who's coming in. Um, and it gives you that opportunity to vet the person with them not being outside in the weather and all that, but it's also to ensure that they are coming through the office and not just before we put vestibules in, once someone, in, when you don't have a vestibule with the old school designs, when you open the door, 
you, it was a choice whether you would go into the office or whether you just proceed into the building as a whole. That's the big thing. That's the main thing about a vestibule. It's, it removes that choice um, and it, it allows for additional vetting of visitors if needed. That's the, that's the biggie. Uh, and then the other question when you're talking about the frosted glass or the glass that's sore to break, I understand changing them as the need arises to replace things, but it also seems like if there are things that are fingertips that we can use, why don't we put those, prioritize those types of items instead of waiting? So it, it's fun. It's, it become, becomes an issue of money and prioritizing funds. Um, none of these things are inexpensive, really. Um, even that film is it's quite expensive. It adds quite a bit to the cost of every door and glass replacement that we do. That said, if that's something that, you know, it's determined we want to prioritize, it, it could be done. Um, I think me personally, and what we've heard a lot since the incident in Uvalde is door propping. And so right now, I, I, you know, enhancing, continuing the rollout of our access control system and, um, and really making sure we address that concern um, I, I feel like that is my personal opinion, um, and it was sort of the track we were already on, but it, it's money. It comes down to prioritization and funds. Okay, and then my other, it's more of a, a comment just to think about as a school division and as a board. Um, I usually try to keep like my concerns as a parent separate, um, but at some point, I feel like it's healthy to acknowledge you know, especially all the things that are going on, just thinking out loud in real time, like th this is a normal, right? <laughs> like we're not living in, this shouldn't be acceptable and it's okay to like be worried and stressed. And so um, I just wanted, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge like parents that reach out or even me myself, like there's a parent that had emailed and I had talked to them previously, about whatever the bulletproof backpacks and why don't we invest in things like that? And the truth is I look up bulletproof backpacks and I go, are we there yet? And so when we're talking about the security enhancements and safety, I think that in an acknowledgement that this is not a normal way to live, that we have to kind of talk about these things, even if we go that's too much or that's scary or we can't afford it. Like we should start talking about these things because as a parent, I worry about these things. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be on the school board is because the first picture I got of my daughter in school is a picture of her in a lockdown drill in the closet. And in first grade, she said, we can all fit in the closet. It's a great classroom. And so like, this is just me being a parent, not really a school board member, but to say like, we're not living in normal times, so we shouldn't just keep doing security. And, like everything, we should talk about things and it should be on the table, even if we don't go in any particular direction, but to just acknowledge that like, there's an anxiety. Um, even, it's more now that there's shootings that are like, when you when it's kids in a classroom, it, it, it triggers it more. But the truth is, it's there all the time, that anxiety and that stress, it's low, but it's always there. And so, that's just my thoughts, just thinking out loud for where we are. I just want to say that there that the door was not propped, and I just don't want to be a you know a, I don't want this board to be any spot for um, misinformation because there's a lot of misinformation. The door was unlocked apparently, according to the latest version, um, and I think what we have discussed in the past is that. Um, that somebody would be notified in our division if they, in fact, like in our latest security measures, somebody would be notified if a door was unlocked, which of course I think would be very helpful in this case. Um, uh, and I definitely just really, is this whole thing is uh, tragic, sad, I'm devastated and of course worried for our staff and our students and our community. And um, thank you all for being uh, willing to address the kind of hard things that we have to talk about here. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, and thank you. I know we had a, a pretty thorough and comprehensive um, presentation last Mr. month, yeah. you know, and, and unfortunately because of Buffalo and now Uvalde, you know, we, we asked that you kind of review some of this. So I do appreciate you pulling this together and bringing this forward again. Um, I think because of the storms tonight, we did have, and I, I did share with you all um, that there is a, a group of students, young adults, a new group that's forming called The Voice. And I was able to um, attend kind of their kickoff meeting um, this weekend. And, and you know, it's sad um, as it is, you know, their, their main focus or reason for meeting um, this weekend was to talk about safety and whether or not they feel safe in school and what that would look like. Um, and so it was a very thoughtful group um, with a lot of great points and they really, their intent was to be here tonight to share out, but I think the storms kind of derailed them. Um, I anticipate that they'll be sharing an email um, out with us, um, you know, and or me, um, and I'll be happy to, to share that out with everybody, but I, I look forward to hearing more from them. I think to have that perspective um, and also to segue into um, the survey that you all did, uh, the school safety survey, you know, which, which um, gathered data from students and, and from staff, um, but they do have an interest. And again, I did share that with you that they have an interest and in, some have an interest. And I think if some have an interest in wanting to, to receive that data, um, then we have to figure out how to share that out with them. And, and I know that, you know, everybody will, will make sure that we can figure that out. Um, but I did want to acknowledge that, that they did have the intent um, and they were going to show up tonight. Um, and so I look forward to, to hearing from them because it's really important, you know, not just to, to know um, how the students are feeling right now, but I also want to take a minute, and some of us have done this, and I know we all feel this way, but to acknowledge the weight of this on our staff and the teachers and, and everybody um, in the school buildings, in grocery stores, in hospitals as of yesterday, you know, I mean, it, it's unfortunately um, and terrifying that it's kind of happening everywhere. But our, our you know, goal and job here as a board is to do everything we can to um, support um, and to continue to enhance the safety and to share it out with community members or parents, um, whoever needs to hear it. Um, and as many times as they need to hear it. I, you know, I, I trust that we will do that um, because I know it's weighing heavily on everybody, you know, and, and as Chandra said, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm not, and I said to Mr. Morse, you know, I'm not okay. And I think it's okay for us to say right now, you know, we're, we're not okay with how things are, and, but what are we gonna do about it, right? And so I look forward to us continuing the work that we can do right here to, to you know, keep our students and staff um, as safe as we can here in Charlottesville City Schools. So thank you again for your report and your time. I appreciate it. And appreciate, you know, everybody who, the team, IT team, everybody, you know, as far as cameras and, and all of that. So we'll keep at it. Thank you. All right, uh, we have 10.6 uh, policy updates, Dr. Baptist. I know this can be an arduous task. And for those who have been on the board for a while, I know you were anxiously awaiting it. For those who are new on the board, um, a couple of things. The Virginia School Boards Association does have an annual policy meeting usually the Wednesday before Memorial Day, which is what they did this year, where they give updates based on um, changes within the General Assembly. And they generally take one or two sections and really go through them to try to clean up language and whatnot. So this time, um, Section B was one of the ones that got more of, of the work. Um, and some of what they did there were just cleaning up you know, pronouns and just clarifying language, make it make more sense. Uh, lots of places they updated references, and I never make any change in a policy, even the reference, if it's just the reference, without it coming to the board so that you can see that that has 
change. Um, and then every five years, there's a law that every five years, every policy must be reviewed. So that's why you've got one section that is policies that we haven't done anything with in the last five years and seem to pretty much still be the same. So I don't know how you want to go through this, but in the big policy update, I tried to tell you just when it was a legal reference that was, uh, was changed or cross-reference, or if there was any wording changed, what the wording was. So really this year, there were not as many substantive changes by VSBA and anything that was pretty much changed was done based on a, a change in the Virginia code through the uh, General Assembly. So I will be glad to tackle this any way you want to tackle it. And there, there are three sets, I will say that. We've got the big set and you've got a table that explains that. We've got the small set that is policies that are um, the five-year policies. And then I think we've got three policies that have come based on work from committees here in the school system, not VSBA. Two of them are from a committee that's been working on equity and policy, and I've got those in there. And then Ms. Powell had one policy that she wanted um, revised about uh, non-resident students. So I put them separate because they were not VSBA recommendations. The, the, th the three, the yeah, smaller the, group. The, the CCS. The CCS, Dr. Kraft okay. Is asking to take a um, look at the CCS ones. Okay. So those, um, uh, there's 12 pages of them. The Equal Employment Opportunity, GB, GCL, Professional Staff Development. And uh, those were two that were by the policy, the Equity and Policy Committee. And basically they were, uh, the first one was some editorial changes when you're looking at um, uh, pronouns and just editing language. And then for their one about professional staff development, bringing in, it was, it was more of a reorganization of the entire policy. And, but you're know, bringing in the important aspects of professional learning for um, equity pieces. And rather than trying to make some of the changes, it was just easier to cross out and then put in new language. So it's not as much that the whole thing was changed. And uh, again, for the, the new folks, anything that I change, I do the cross outs and then add in the underline in bold so you can tell the changes. And again, nothing has been changed on any of them without your approval. Questions about any of those three? Work done by to com uh, the committee for the first two, which I think was good work to clean those up and to really add in the professional learning, it was making sure that the information is added in there about culturally responsive teaching and more um, professional learning about equity were the main additions there. I'm sorry, those first two have been vetted by the equity committee and approved by the equity committee yes. already. They actually did the work and Mexico, who's hiding behind us, um, <laughs> brought those to me and we looked through them. And I was on the committee for part of the work, um, but worked through those and looked at it and then bring them to you. And then for the one about the admissions for non resident students, the change in that is more about um, a section on the pavement of fees that Ms. Powell added in to, to make that clearer. So any questions about these three? I'm not asking for approval tonight. These are just here to see if you have any questions about any of them. Okay. Which group would you like to look at next? I was just interested in the school board meeting, remote participation. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I was interested in the remote participation aspects of the school board meetings under BB or B. Those revisions to the um, BBD. Yeah, I'm like, sorry. BDD, was, electronic school board meetings. Yeah, I just, or remote participation and the distinction between that, that and. That policy probably does have more 
implications to it than some of the others. And the reason I have my laptop here is to I'll make sure I've got the notes from the meeting about that policy. What that policy does for school board members is sets the number of meetings that can be attended remotely, number or percentage of meetings that can be, can, where the member can meet remotely. Um, and the recommendation is either two meetings or 25% of the scheduled meetings. And that would be not just the monthly meetings, but any time the school board has a, an official meeting that would count toward the 25% that a member could meet remotely. And it um, outlines the procedure that but we But that's need. for personal reasons. It seems like there's a distinction between there's, sick and personal reasons. There are three different reasons. Yeah. And for each of them, it will now have to include in the minutes what the reason was. So if it's a personal reason, it would have to be information in the minutes. Doesn't say it has to be said out loud in the meeting, but the chair would have to have it and the clerk would have to put it in the um, meeting. Same thing for medical. If it's medical for the um, member, board member, that also has to be in the minutes as it's just for a family member. And it's also mentioned in there that if uh, the meeting is held 60 miles away from your home, and somebody says, where would you be meeting 60 miles away from your home? If, let's say you go to VSBA, the conference in Williamsburg, and you decide to have a meeting while you're there, that is long, that is greater than 60 miles from here. So one of you who did not go to the conference could use the 60 mile rule for that purpose. Yeah, I just think this is a, so is this, is this policy, um, basically what the regulations are? Yes, it, it goes with um, the, the codes that are listed there, 2.2, um, 3708.3 and House Bill 444, and it does become effective 9122. So there's a little delay. And I, and I think part of the reason for the delay could be because while this was going in, you know, it was the bigger deal was during COVID. And now that hopefully COVID will eventually settle down <laughs> that there'll be less need for uh, the remote meetings. And this of course is different than if the entire uh, meeting is remote and then it would be a virtual meeting versus a remote meeting. Okay, great. So um, I just think that, so right now we have a much more permissive way of, or is it more, where are we now in terms of the policy? Like um, this well, starts nine one, what, what are we under right now? You're not under a set number right now because oh. this bill goes into effect September 1. Now this policy, and I also asked if it was meant to be a 12 month year starting July 1, or if it's January 1, it's January 1. So it'd be January 1 through December. So starting in January, um, the clerk would be keeping track of the number of meetings to see if a member gets to over two or over 25% of meetings. And then let's say someone did, and you had a, a vote to whether to allow the person to be remote or not. If the vote board voted no, because the number has been exceeded, the member can still monitor the meeting. They just cannot participate in the meeting. So they could still be on Zoom or, or whatever else. They just would not be participating in any discussion or any votes. Okay, I think that's really helpful. I just also want to clarify that meeting also means like work sessions and these random closed sessions we have that are any time that the board meets. And if you're having like a, a disciplinary committee and it's a, a just a less than a quorum, yeah. it would not count. But if you have a quorum gathered in one place and the, it is official meeting, both uh, Leslie and Julia asked me about what about when the um, school board is meeting with city council. If board chair calls the Charlottesville city school board to order, then that would be considered a meeting. And Ms. Ms. McKee, with the, um, the answer to your question about what are we currently working on, it's the strike through part on page 31. Yeah. Um, the part about participation by a school board member, it's the two meetings of 25%. That's what it currently is. Even with the, well, it does. I'm sorry, real quickly. So disciplinary committee meetings, there's three of us, and that is, we do notice that. 
you can notice that, but that is not a full Charlottesville City School Board meeting because you've got less than a quorum right. coming. Okay. But anytime you would have a quorum right. located in one place for a meeting, then it would be. Okay. Now. Thank you. So uh, we've been having closed session before our public meeting. So would each of those count separately as a meeting, separate meeting? Those would be meetings because they're being called to order as a meeting. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's, I guess it adds up to a lot it, of meetings. Well, it, it does. And so school board clerk will need to keep a rolling number. You can't just start at the beginning of January and say, it's 25% of the meetings is going to be X because you don't know January 1st how many meetings you're going to have. So it will be more of a rolling number. And so they'll need to keep up with the number of meetings and what that 25% threshold is. So our clerks will have to do that? Our clerk, <laughs> our clerk is wonderful and she's already started that, so. Well, we've already talked about it, so <laughs> she's ready for you. So that one in section B really had more, um, like I said, implications for you. Um, the one about minutes, for some reason they changed reported to the word taken, but that was the change in the law. Um, again, many of the things are change of pronouns. So change from, they change things from future tense to present tense, because if it's your policy, you should already be doing it. You shouldn't talk about what you're going to do. So that's one reason why you see uh, quite a few policies changing from future tense to present tense. Any other policies you would like for me to spend more time on? So you'll be bringing us these back to us in August, or do we not have to make a some Generally, we them. do it at a second meeting in June or either at a board retreat or some other advance, excuse me, whatever advance. meeting. But we can also do this in August. The we thing can about, also do it in August. The thing about doing it in August, though, several of the laws come into effect July 1, so we need to have the policies in place. Not all of them, but... Most laws do become effective on July 1 unless they have a, a different date on it. We've encountered this issue multiple times over the past. Pardon me? We've, been, we've encountered this issue multiple times over the past. So it, it's, you can either have a, if you have an issue with any of these policy changes, it's really important to bring it to our attention now yeah. or in the coming weeks because these changes are going to be basically rubber stamped. So um, I, yeah, I recommend, I mean, we have our advance on the 11th. So if, if people feel like they don't have enough reading material and would like to study these a little bit more in depth, and if there's any concerns. One thing about doing it then too, if any, uh, handbooks or whatever need to be updated, you want to have the most current policies in there. And again, there's not as much change to substance in this group, because there wasn't as much substance um, for education in the General Assembly this time as it was to some other topics. So this was not as big a year for educational policy. So the three things that we do as a board is policy, the budget, and hiring and firing the superintendent. So this is a pretty significant part of a job. Now, typically, Beth, Dr. Bactus does an amazing job of just making these great tables for us and for um, helping us to understand the, the changes that are coming into effect. So, but it is for people who are pretty new to the board, something pretty important for you to pay attention to, because this is the governing, I mean, not that you guys know because your relationship with schools, but it is important. And I just want to give as much time to that if there are concerns about anything in this. That's all, and I'm happy to move it to June to June first to June 11th. No, I'm not saying that we need to take action on the on the 11th, but you know we could bring if we had further questions. No, why are you saying no? We have a lot going on on that day, and I don't think that this is that's going to be an appropriate time to do it. I mean, I think if we have no objection, fine. But if 
we should have the questions outside of, you know, well in advance of the advance so that Dr. Baptist is not surprised at the next. And in no way was I meaning to intend that she needs to stand up there and be prepared to, I just was picking that as a date, as an opportunity the next time that we're all together, we yeah. can send emails or whatever. So I appreciate you bringing this. Well, it, you know, it's a tedious task. I don't think anybody really, you know, looks forward to going through all these, but I think it is important. I love it. it that we, I do. I love you like it. it. You, you do. You're the only person who does in the what universe, I I think, but, um, but, you know, I think it, it would be important for us each to do our homework and spend some time going through these. When I'm sorry you didn't get them till Tuesday morning. The meeting was last Wednesday, and I worked on them all Memorial Day hey, weekend. That's all right. I can't believe you're still doing this with all the other jobs you have. So I love. I'm not kidding. I love this. <laughs> you do. Really appreciate you. And that's we're lucky that you do. Any other questions on anything right now, Mr. Bryant? No, not right now. Thank you, Dr. Baptist. Appreciate it. All right, now we have um, board response to written reports. And we will move on to our next comments from members of the community. So, yeah, if you're here and you would like to make comment, please come up to the podium, state your name and address, and you have um, three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nomi Dave. I'm a parent of uh, two children in Charlottesville City Schools, one at Jackson Via and one at Walker. I'm also a member of the Charlottesville Coalition for Gun Violence Prevention. And on behalf of our group, I want to first of all thank um, the school board for the caring and compassionate message that you sent out last Tuesday after the shootings in Texas. We're really grateful for that prompt and also action-oriented response, so thank you. And this week, our group sent a follow-up draft statement to Ms. Torres and Dr. Gurley on common sense gun safety measures. As many people in this country know, gunfire kills more children ages one through 19 than any other cause of death in the United States. Many of these deaths can be prevented by talking to kids about gun safety and by adopting safe gun storage measures. And here I'll note, I'm pleased to hear that we've been, there's been such um, rich discussion about safety measures just now, but in, in what I'm saying, I'd just like to draw our attention to the fact that there are things that we can do before we even have to get to run, hide, and fight. Um, in the state of Virginia, State law requires that gun owners store firearms where a child is unlikely to gain access. In fact, it's a class one misdemeanor for um, a person to rec recklessly leave a gun um, where a child under the age of 14 can access it. We hope that the school board will issue a statement about gun safety measures and work with us or with other advocates to produce information that can be shared with families and community members. I'd just like to note that in school shootings, 78% of active school, active school shooters got their guns from home. So in addition to the safety drills and the active shooter drills that we've just um, been talking about in this session, um, how can we do more to make sure that the guns never get to schools in the first place? I want to end by saying, as we all know, gun violence prevention is a racial justice issue. It's a gender justice issue. It's an issue to protect our kids, our teachers, grandparents, friends, relatives, and neighbors. It involves common sense practices that the majority of people support. We know this from so, many, so much polling, and also that are known by research to reduce mass shootings. The goal that we all have in common is to increase the safety of our kids, our school staff, and our community uh, members. Thank you very much to the school board and to our wonderful schools and teachers and staff for everything that you're doing to create a safe, loving, and nurturing environment for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And if anybody else would like to make a statement or if there's anybody, nobody on Zoom. All right, thank you. Okay, we will um, roll on to comments from the board. And I'm gonna start with Mr. Bryant. Um, being that I've been on Zoom for eight hours, I don't have too many comments, except to say um, uh, it was a very productive meeting and uh, got lots and loads of information. And uh, certainly um, the policy uh, update, uh, revisiting that is, 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 is important. So um, if I could get, a, 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 I don't know, do we have copies of that? The, the links are in the presentation. The links, okay, so I have to go with the links. Okay, the presentation. But other than that, I don't have anything else to say. I've already um, given my update on this uh, spreadsheet. Thank you, sir. I hope you feel better. Ms. McKeever. Thank you. I, I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody. That's all. And um, I appreciate you all being ready for all my random questions, so thank you. Ms. Bryson Morseberger. Uh, no comments other than to say um, to the teachers, students, staff, family, administration, everybody, that um, I, I hope that, um, I don't even know, what I, we've made it through this year, it seems like, so I just wanna thank everybody for everything, um, everybody in the buildings, all the parents, the community, it's been a rough year, and. Um, just thank everybody for, you know, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Thank you. Mr. Morse. I would say I second those comments. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Dr. Kraft. Yeah, I'd like to just give a special shout out to the graduating class of 2022. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing them graduate, right? And, um, they, you know, they've really endured so much, you know, of, of all the classes, you know, that we've had, they have experienced much of their high school careers uh, during a pandemic. And I think it's been really rough. Um, and uh, anyway, I just admire them for their perseverance and endurance and um, yeah. Um, and uh, congratulations to all of the students and their families on reaching this milestone. And see you the Ting Pavilion next week. I second. Miss mm. Dooley. No, and it is, you know, it feels like we are living in really heavy times right now. Um, so I think it's really great to highlight the celebrations that we have um, happening. So. Looking forward to graduation next week and Buford's promotion ceremony as well. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the KTEC completer uh, ceremony this week and our very own Black Knight, um, Nyonica Carter, um, who is a cosmetology student, was one of the selected student speakers. Um, and it was really special to hear her speak about her experience. Um, and I'm eager to see um, she has aspirations to uh, be a hairstylist. Um, and I have no doubt that she will be very successful in those um, efforts. Um, and also I uh, wanna congratulate Dr. Gurley for making it close to the end of your first school year here with us <laughs> in the city. Um, we're grateful for your leadership um, and look forward to continued work with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just like double, triple everything that everybody said. Um, yes, and thank you to you. I also want to, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but notice that there was a celebration for some of our staff who are retiring. So um, I know years past we attended and it was always fun to kind of see and, and welcome and wish, welcome wishes or send them off with wishes uh, to enjoy their retirement. So I, again, just want to extend my gratitude to, to staff and students and staff, you know, showed up um, every day for students. And this was, this was an incredibly challenging year. Last year was an incredibly challenging year, the year before. So, I mean, it's, it's new times, it's hard times, but um, again, you, you're showing up for those kids and making a difference. Um, and we appreciate that. 
I appreciate this board. So thank you all for the work. Um, we've had we've had some some challenging things um, brought brought before us, but you know we all pull together and appreciate the support of staff as well. So thank you all. And I will uh, turn the mic over to you, Dr. Gurley. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank before I get started. I want to thank the um, the executive leadership team. Um, it's just a phenomenal group of ladies sitting here. Then you have Pat who works hard behind the scenes and Bev Chuck over there in the corner and, and, and Denise Johnson. I mean, every day just showing up and doing the work and, and, and putting up with me <laughs> each and every day. And just thankful for our principals, our teachers, our custodians, our bus drivers, our instructional assistants, our admin techs. Um, I probably shouldn't have named people because I probably forgot someone, but I just appreciate that everyone shows up for our children and, and just for our concern, um, our concerned citizens to, you know, speak about the, the gun, the gun control. And, and, and we know that we got to, we have to do this work together. And we have put some information on our website um, from Region 10, and it, and it does have some gun safety information and also some re, some free resources as it relates to medicine, um, medicine control and, um, and devices for guns and so. Um, but I also want to just um, just congratulate some people. Um, we had three winners of the uh, of the Edna and Eleanor, um, I'm sorry, the Edgar and Eleanor Shannon Foundation. And so um, Catherine Gray over at Clark uh, was one of the winners. Uh, Samantha Pagney was one of the winners. And then Magna, uh, I'm sorry, Maggie Funkner. Um, she was also one of the winners. So just shout out to those, um, those ladies for all their hard work and being recognized uh, through the um, Shannon Grant um, project. And then Dr. Uh, Ms. Torres did uh, mention last night, we did have the, uh, the ceremony for our retirees and, and all of this information will be for the public. So I won't go through all the names, but it was, it was a really small and intimate um, um, ceremony. And I think the HR team did a really good job of uh, putting that on last evening. And we got to honor um, each and every one of uh, Ms. Dooley already mentioned about the KTEC. Um, the completer ceremony and it, it was it was really so nice and again just another um, way for us to gather and recognize our students and still remain um, COVID safe and um, Mr. Morris was there as well so it was just great seeing everyone and then um, reconfiguration uh, just and I'm, I'm going to start slowly moving away from calling a reconfiguration to our middle school project, um, because really that's what it is now, right? And it, it's real. So we do have a signed contract for this, um, from the city. So the work is um, going to commence and work has been happening um, even behind the scenes. Um, and so we are moving forward with the redesign, which is really um, just it's a blessing at this point. And we have we do have $68.8 million allocated for the project. And so this summer we will be gearing up to do a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, we had a meeting earlier this week with uh, Wick Knock and uh, Mike Goddard just talking about who are some of the stakeholders that we will be engaging um, over the summer. Um, for the um, to get some input with regards to just how this project will look and so just very excited and then last but certainly not least um, it is pride month it is pride month every month in Charlottesville um, but we get a month <laughs> um, to be extra prideful and so just thankful for the Charlottesville community it was um, really nice on Tuesday to see our students and our staff um, I was over here at the high school just to see our students and staff and just students being unapologetically themselves but also seeing students who are allies seeing our staff members who are allies and that's really what Charlottesville is about it's about being a community and so it is uh, very great times, despite all of the all of the things going on in the world. It's um, just really special um, to be in the Charlottesville community, and that is it for me. Thank you, sir. All right, anything for our work session wrap up? Nope. All right, and upcoming meetings, we do have um, our board advance June eleventh. 
Um, and then we have, which is at KTEC. Um, graduation is not a meeting, but again, another plug for graduation next week. And then a little break and summer, and we have our uh, meeting August 4th back here um, at the Media Center. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting.